Good evening, everybody. Uh, welcome to the Game and Fish Advisory Board meeting for the eastern part of the state. I'm Terry Steinland, Director of the Game and Fish Department, and this is only the second time we've done this. We did one last night for the western districts, uh, and, and hopefully we get, get through this one. Uh, it's a little new experience for us. We usually have these public meetings, but uh, because of the coronavirus, we've all had to adjust, and uh, this is one way we're adjusting. We don't know how long we're going to do it this way. Uh, Maybe the fall meetings might be the same. We'd still like to get out and talk to everybody because it's just a method for us to contact and get to know you also. But for now, we're going to have to do it this way. Uh, there are eight of us, uh, actually, I'm sorry, nine of us in the auditorium here right now, and we are practicing social distancing and uh, pretty well distanced from each other, even though on our Facebook page it showed uh, it was just the angle last night. Uh, I guarantee you there's enough, enough room between everybody. Uh, some of these guys don't like each other anyway, so that's why they're social distancing. Uh, we had provided an email address uh, on our uh, on news release, uh, and it's showing up, it should be showing up on your screen, that uh, for questions to come in prior to the meeting, and we did get some questions, and thank you for that. We appreciate it. Uh, some of those questions will be answered during the presentations that, that we'll be giving. The uh, rest of them probably will wait till the question and answer period afterwards. And if we don't get to your particular question during the meeting, or if it's not answered during the presentation, please use that email address to contact us and provide us a contact information so we can get back to either by phone or by email. Uh, and there may be a, a specific question that we don't have an immediate answer to, Again, if you could just give us contact information, we'll make sure the right people get back to you. Uh, in the room, I'd like to introduce who's already here. Uh, in the room, uh, Scott Peterson, uh, commonly known as the best deputy director in the nation, is here. Uh, I didn't give him that. He gave that title to himself, so we'll just leave it at that. Uh, Jeb Williams, our wildlife division chief. Uh, Greg Link, our conservation and communications chief. Uh, Ashley Solway, who's producing this, and if she gets sick, we're in trouble because we're probably not going to get through this. Uh, Mike Anderson, I think you, you probably don't see Mike very often, but you hear him an awful lot. He provides all the two-minute videos, all our webcasts and everything, and does a tremendous job in that. Uh, Greg Freeman, Freeman from our communications section is here. Uh, he'll be asking the questions. You'll hear him in the background. You won't necessarily see him. And I do want to say Carly Berger, she is not here, but she was North Dakota Information Technology. She has been a tremendous help and we really appreciate that. And we also have uh, Alan Riley. Now Carly's not here, but Alan Riley uh, from the IT department actually embedded in our department is here. So if anything goes wrong, uh, we'll know who to blame at that point. Uh, we're going to have some presentations tonight that are going to come from, from our people, from our staff, our, our team members home. So you'll see them from probably a different perspective than you're seeing me, but uh, we have eight advisory districts in the state. Uh, they are appointed by the governor and they do a tremendous job. And uh, last night I introduced the Western Advisory Board district members. And tonight I'm going to do a kind of a double dip on some of these. Uh, I'll start out that Dave Nering doesn't show up on the, what's on your screen right now, but Dave Nering is our, our chair. He's actually in the room with us also. He's making sure we don't mess up here. Uh, but on the districts that are showing on your screen. Uh, Dwayne Hansen is out of West Fargo in District 5. <clears throat> Cody Sand is a vice chairman of the committee or the, uh, of the advisory board committee. He's out of Ashley in District 6. Tom Rost is out of Devil's Lake in District 3. And Bruce Ellerson, Ellerson is out of Michigan in District 5. And another one that's showing, not showing up here, but part of his district is half east, half west, if you use Highway 83 as a dividing line. Travis Lear, uh, also out of Alba, and he's out of District 2. So uh, we will go through the agenda topics right now, and uh, we're going to start out with uh, hunter, hunter education modifications due to the coronavirus issue. Then we'll get into general game and habitat license for lotteries, which is going to be a little change. We'll explain that. And then we'll have some big game updates, fisheries questions, or fisheries updates, and then a question and answer period. Uh, and to start it out, uh, I'm going to ask Greg Link. He's the chief of our communications and conservation division. And uh, again, the coronavirus has really caused us to, to, to make some modifications to how we do things. And Greg's going to explain uh, what we're doing to accommodate uh, that particular issue. So Greg, I will ask you to come up here.
Thanks, Terry. Well, hello, everybody. Good evening. Um, like Terry said, I'll give a rundown on uh, how we're going to approach the Hunter Ed certification for um, this year, 2020, due to the coronavirus. So I won't make to look at me too long. I'll jump right into our presentation here. Um, as uh, most people know, but, and, and maybe you don't, but North Dakota state law requires anybody over uh, uh, who's born after December 31st, 1961, or is 12 years old, of age or older, um, must complete and pass the hunter education certification before they can obtain a North Dakota hunting license. And North Dakota Game and Fish Department's responsible for administering the hunter education program and uh, uh, administering the course and its testing standards. And we enlist uh, about 800 plus dedicated um, hunter ed volunteer instructors to help us do that. And uh, we normally push through about 4,500 to 5,000 students a year. And uh, that normally a lot of that is taking place during winter and spring period although we, they do continue all the way through the year, but we were right in the heart of, of our pushing our programs out when the corona uh, situation um, hit us. And by mid-March, we were asking our, our instructors to start canceling courses due to the um, social gathering restrictions um, of less than 10 people. And so uh, we had about a, only about 1,000 students um, that had gone through the course prior to that. So we knew we had a, a lot of folks that still need to get through um, the course yet this year. And uh, again, the prime time is right before um, the deer lottery application deadline, which is uh, moving on us in June 3rd. So I know there's a lot of folks out there that were really anxious to figure out what are we going to do. Some are right in the middle of, of they enrolled in a course or even probably in a course at the time this all went down. So um, we're going to cover um, who really needs it, who doesn't, and then kind of how we're going to approach the folks who, who do need it. But um, realize there's a lot of folks out there that maybe think they need it. And normally um, we teach students, uh, you know, starting from age 11, but actually um, persons, students, um, prospective hunters, I should say, that are younger than age 12 do not actually need to be hunter certified. They can hunt in North Dakota and that's been allowed for a long time as long as they're with a adult or guardian. Um, there's also a lot of 11 year olds that are, are turning 11 in this year that are able to uh, get their first white tail doe uh, youth deer um, license. And those students do not, or those hunters do not need actually to have their hunter education certification yet this year either. Um, people who don't, who hunt on exclusively on their own land don't. And then there's also another provision, an opportunity in North Dakota that's available. Uh, it's called the apprentice license. And so um, that's a provision that's been around for a while that actually allows someone to trial, try hunting um, before they have to go through the whole hunter ed certification. So it's a one year, one time um, hunting allowance as long as that person is hunting with a accompanied by uh, someone who is an adult that is licensed. So we're actually encouraging folks who haven't utilized that provision um, to, to utilize that this year and reduce the log jam that we're, we're going to be facing in getting students through the course. So, um, but the folks or prospective hunters who do need the course, um, this is kind of how we're going to approach it this year. Um, we've uh, put together a contingency plan that allows for an online course. Uh, we initiated that last week. Um, we are online um, course provider um, actually pro uh, is allowing a reduced 25 percent reduction reduced price. Um, so that's going to be available to anybody who will turn 12 in 2020. Um, and upon completion of that course, online course of students will be provided a, a temporary certification, which will allow them then to apply, purchase and obtain a 2020 North Dakota hunting license. So the folks that were probably already 
um, enrolled in a course or registered for a course, you got uh, right away. You got a an email message from us. We reached out to you and told you how to to, to work your way through the online course. But those folks who had not already uh, enrolled in a course, I'll give you a rundown on, on what it what's kind of required. So just go to our Game and Fish website, um, register um, at our on our Hunter Ed um, site for a course. Um, once you do that, you'll receive and uh, be able to review some of our information, prerequisite information. There's a video and some other information that we want you to take a look at before you go through the online course. You'll get a code that then you can um, um, be allowed into uh, proceed to the online course. Uh, once you get through that and complete it, you'll have about two weeks to do that. And uh, once you're completed, you will receive. We'll 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 know about it uh, from our provider, and uh, you will be given a, a temporary certification. Again, that cert temporary certification allows you to then apply, purchase, and obtain a North Dakota license for this year. Um, the second part of that, though, is that once this uh, pandemic situation um, hopefully um, subsides somewhat, then we can lift the restriction, um, the gathering social gathering restriction. We would then start up our um, our practical, our follow up, hands on, in person, written test, and practical test. And uh, you would need to anybody who has a temporary certification will need to have that um, taken care of by December 31st. Um, otherwise, that will be revoked. Um, the department is going to really be ramping up and. Uh, putting a lot of our staff out there in, in the eight urban areas, as well as probably uh, some traveling teams to help administer those practical um, courses. And also, uh, we will also be hopefully starting our traditional courses again at some point later this year. So again, that's unknown as, as, as to when that's exactly going to happen, um, but we'll be kind of watching this pandemic thing. And as it winds down and it's safe to do so, we'll We'll get back on track and uh, we'll let folks know um, when those are those practicals and our traditional courses are are coming online. So um, any questions? Yeah, Greg, we have two questions for you. Uh, the first one is I partially completed the course when it was canceled due to COVID-19. Will I have to start the online course from the beginning or where I left off? Um, unfortunately, um, whether you were either online or on a online a previous online course or um, our a traditional course, if that was canceled midstream, you're going to have to um, jump into this online course and start start all over again. Um, unfortunately, that's um, that's what, what you're going to have to do. And the last question for you, Greg, is: Can two kids in the same household watch online from the same computer? OK, our uh, our online provider tracks every student separately, so um, they will have to register, um, pay that price um, for to, to, to be enrolled and to go through the course. They'll be tracked individually, so they'll actually have to be um, assigned a, a number and, and tracked all the way through. So um, two students actually can't um, just pay one price and watch the same course and it, that won't work. So unfortunately that will have to be two people doing two separate courses. All right, thank you. OK, hey, thank you, Greg. I'm uh, going to have to adjust the camera for our short people. Thanks, Greg. Appreciate that. <laughs> But uh, again, this is a little bit of an inconvenience for everybody. Uh, I tell you, Greg and, and his team uh, really came up with on, on the fly some really, uh, really good options here, I believe. And uh, actually, we, we, we got to owe some credit to the entity that we contract with for the online services because they actually cut the cost during this pandemic uh, to help us out a little bit and to help everybody else out there that needs it. So. Again, thank you, Greg. Great job on that. Uh, next thing is uh, going to talk about the general game and habitat stamp uh, when applying for the lottery. Uh, it's one of those that 
when we went to the electronic system, we were able to find out who did or did not have a general game and habitat license. And by law, that is required before you can receive uh, any big game license in North Dakota. And what's coming up shortly here is certainly the, the deer gun season. So uh, actually, Brian Hosick, who's a business manager with the department here, actually came up with something very well that I'm going to ask him to, to uh, present to you. Brian? Thanks, Terry. Uh, hopefully everyone can uh, hear me and see me okay here. Um, uh, good, e good evening, everyone. I, thanks for joining this uh, online live feed here. Um, just going to provide some brief updates on the changes that will occur with our online licensing system um, in regards to the uh, coming up uh, for the deer gun lottery applications here, uh, mostly in regards to the general game and habitat license here. OK, um, just a little background on this. Um, we had when we went online in. Uh, when, maybe my screen screen's not sharing here. Bear with me here in case my screen's not sharing. Maybe someone at the podium can give me a thumbs up here. OK. <laughs> All right, so yes, a little background on the general game and habitat license. Um, uh, prior to us going online, we had uh, um, uh, a lot of uh, applications that were coming by paper, and um, it was a little more difficult to really find out those applicants that were not properly licensed and uh, when we made that move to go online it was a lot uh, really helped us to to look at this information and, and assist those people that were coming in to uh, have the proper license when they were out in the field so um, we've made some changes uh, those recent changes we've made over the years for that we wanted to really extend this into the into the lottery portion of this um, and make some uh, provide some conveniences for for those that are coming through. Um, as as mentioned here to acquire a deer gun license, uh, applicants must first obtain a general game and habitat license here. So um, that's what we're really starting off with. Um, again, we made a lot of progress on that, but there's still that there's still that widget or that tangible item. So at that even when you uh, um, go in and apply for a lottery, um, we still want to get you that. We have the, the tangible part of that with the deer license tag, the printed tag to, to get to get printed and mailed off to you. So um, that's a little bit of background on kind of how that that general game and habitat and uh, licenses worked in the past and, and some of the challenges that we have here. So um, who will these challenges apply to? These 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 or who will these changes apply to? These changes will only apply to those that have not purchased the required licenses prior to the lottery application. So, if you came in in uh, in mid March or, or early April and bought your your license, um, you're not going to see any changes here. Uh, this will be mostly for those that have yet to come visit our system for this new license season, and uh, uh, we're going to provide some conveniences as they're coming in to apply for this upcoming deer lottery application. Um, so what is the purpose for the changes? Um, there's 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 several here. One, we want to you know, we want to continue to prove our our services. Um, there's always an opportunity to to uh, improve that user experience and we, we, we monitor these and, and make these uh, slight changes as necessary. Um, but also it's a it's a goal of ours to uh, really get the the applicants or license, you know, those that come in to purchase a license to get them in and out of our system as quickly as possible. Uh, make this as, as convenient for them to come in and buy and apply. Um, another another thing here we have is we have a, a variety of license requirements and we have a, we really have a variety a number of licenses. Um, and so the type of the type of license you purchase along with the you know if it's resident or non-resident, youth, landowners, military, attendees of uh, North Dakota College or University, this kind of matrix um, you know, this varies the different the license requirements vary with some of these things. And so 
we really want to assist those that are that are unfamiliar with the licensing requirements and help them complete their purchase. Um, again, get them in, get them in and out of the system. And uh, I think with the with the licensing system we have now, it's we made we made a tremendous amount of, of, of progress with that, and it's it's just something that we can uh, extend to the lottery here. So. Um, we have, as, as mentioned here, we've had some success with the non-lottery license side of this. Uh, more, these are more like your dear bow or, or youth or first come first serve type licenses. Uh, those, when, when, when folks come to purchase those licenses, we know what they need behind the scene. As soon as you log into the, to the site, we know and you're making a, a selection, we're able to have that system up, uh, add those licenses for you. So you don't have to uh, know all the different license requirements and go select those. So. Uh, we really want to we're going to extend that side of it for that license side to the to the lottery applications here and provide some conveniences for those that are applying here um and uh and lastly here is we want to we want to provide timely distribution of the license tags um kind of uh kind of mentioned that before is it, you you've you've uh may recall in other advisory board meetings that we had uh um one of our items that was uh, that was uh, fairly regular was the the time to process these lottery applications, and we made some uh, tremendous improvements on that, and have turned around lotteries fairly quickly, um, and that's great. We can get those results out. Uh, with those results, we we uh, remind folks that haven't purchased the proper licenses to go do so, and uh, uh, we also have some other great notification systems that we. We uh, use to do some direct targeted emails or text messages to remind those that haven't purchased those licenses licenses yet. But getting back to that that tangible item or that widget, we want to get you that widget that you purchase as quickly as possible, and that being the Deer license tag that's going to be mailed. And so we want to ensure that with, with that we want to ensure that um, you know applicants that forgot to do so don't get stuck out you know stuck on opening day of the season. Uh, without a license and so I think these changes will definitely help some of that. So how will applicants be presented with these new changes? Um, applicants that have not purchased the required licenses at the time of the application, we're going to prompt them with the choice to select the general game or uh, general game and habitat or combination license. So uh, I, I'll have a uh, mock-up here that we can take a peek at, but again, it's just going to be a, it, it's going to be a prompt uh, for those that have not purchased this, um, and and let you make that selection right before checkout. Um, some other some of the challenges with this, um, you know, we do have although a number of our lottery app uh, deer gun lottery applicants they hunt other big game or upland game and or they've purchased this license before, but we do have. We do have some that exclusively deer gun hunt, and so it, for those that are, uh, exclusively deer gun hunt, they wouldn't necessarily need this license. And so, adding this to the the flow of the lottery application, um, we did offer another solution here for those that that just exclusively exclusively deer gun hunt to uh, uh, provide an option for them to uh, for a refund if they are unsuccessful in the lottery. And so, it's another follow up question that we'll touch on here that I can. I can add with them. I can walk through on the mock up here. So. Right here we have the uh, 2020 resident deer gun license application. Many of you are probably familiar with this. Uh, um, pretty much the same here. We have where the, the choices where you select your first choice unit and second choice unit. Um, as you scroll down this page, you'll see the new section that says required licenses. So. This is where you'll, you'll make that choice. Um, again, only you'll only see this if you haven't purchased one of these licenses yet, but um, you'll make that choice. To, uh, if you purchase a combination license, again, it's a convenience there. It'll tell you the, the amount of that purchase and add it to the cart for you so you don't have to go back into the license area. Um, if you do purchase the general game and habitat license, Again, it shows you the amount of that purchase and it gives you a, it gives you a follow up uh, question here um, asking if uh, if the if you like a refund on this license and if you are going to ask for a refund on this license, um, it, it, if you're unsuccessful, this license would be void. So 
Um, you get to make one of these two selections. Yes, I would like a refund and void this license if unsuccessful or no, I'm going to hunt regardless. And so please just add this license to my cart. So a couple of questions on these. Um, if the refund option is selected, when do the refunds occur for unsuccessful applicants? Um, this is this is a pretty much the same time as the license application refunds occur. Um, for example, if you if you have uh, purchased a a deer gun license at thirty dollars and then uh, added the general game and habitat at twenty dollars, there will be a single transaction refund for those that are unsuccessful or for fifty dollars. Um, so again, those will, those will occur at the same time. Um, what if what if I previously selected the refund option and changed my mind? So for those those weeks that the lottery is opened, if you came in early, if the lottery is opened and before it has been run, run, um, we can. Uh, if, but for any chance, I, we don't really necessarily have uh, for deer gun have any uh, license seasons where you may require this license. But for every reason, if you wanted to purchase that license. You could come back to the uh, site and make that purchase. Um, basically, what we're going to do is just activate that license and there will be no fee at the end of checkout. Um, if the if the refund option is selected, will it show the general game and habitat license on the printable license? So if you were to, uh, the answer is yes. If you, if you were to print this license immediately after the lottery and, and selected that refund option, you're going to see a pending general game and habitat license on there. Um, if you print this out after the lottery has been run, it'll it'll and you are successful. It's just going to look as usual showing that license on there or if unsuccessful, it will not show up at all um, and your refund will have occurred. So um, we did have a, a question from last night um, that uh, came up and that was uh, will these changes apply for for all lotteries and um, for the for the uh, moose, elk, and sheep, the big three, um, those are those are lotteries where the uh, after application, if you are successful in one of those, you do come back and actually buy one of those uh, big three licenses, and we tack that general game and habitat on that license if if you do not have it at that that time of purchase. So it wouldn't necessarily apply to those. What this would apply for coming up would be the pronghorn uh, pronghorn season here or pronghorn application. Um, we do have some of those that exclusively pronghorn hunt and uh, they might find some benefit in that. Um, and, and we're still going to monitor turkey uh, to see if uh, um, not, you know, see if the uh, number of turkey turkey applicants, if there's any that exclusively turkey hunt. So if they're not using that general game and habitat license for other big game or uh, big game or small game hunting. But with that, I, if there's any questions, um, there's a question that came in. Why not keep the system the way it was, meaning the department didn't mail out the tag until the general game and habitat license was purchased? Um, the reason why we, you know, we, um, there are a couple reasons with that. So we end up holding uh, onto these licenses. And again, that there's that, there's that chance that someone that forgot, if they forgot to purchase that license and now it's a uh, Friday at at five o'clock and they just remember to go do that. A lot of these seasons open up on the weekends and uh, it's just really challenging for to have staff uh, available to get that and get that tag in the mail and ship it out to them. And and, and more so too is that we don't, um, once you make that purchase, we really want to, we really want to get you that license immediately. Um, you made the purchase, let's get you that, that widget. And um, I think this, this really solves both of those, those issues there. Okay, well, thanks, Brian. I think we have a couple more questions on that that I'm I'm going to answer, Greg. Yes, um, two more that came in. Do gratis tags need the general game license? No, they do not. Gratis tags are stand by themselves. All you need is a valid gratis license to get out there and hunt on your own land. Uh, another question, Terry. What if some circumstances don't allow a hunter to take the field for the deer season? Will they be re refunded the general game and habitat license amount? Uh, uh, on that particular issue, our policy has, if all you have is a deer gun license, we will refund at that time. Our policy is, as long as that season has not opened yet, 
we will we we will refund it. That is that's a really tough. It's a good question, but a tough question because uh, you're well. You need a general game and small game for for pheasant hunting. But uh, we do we we absolutely will refund the cost of the deer license uh, if it's before the season starts. And appreciate a lot of good questions coming in, and some have been a little late after the presentation has has concluded. Uh, we will get to those at the end. If we do not again get to your question, please email us, and we'll show that at the conclusion here again. Uh, uh, please, please email us with some contact information, and uh, we'll get back to you. Is there any any other questions coming in, Greg? Okay. Uh, with that, we'll move on to the next. It's an update on the electronic posting study. And again, Brian and I are going to tag team on this a little bit. I just want to give you some general updates uh, on, on, on the issue. Uh, I think if, if you're an interested hunter or landowner, you've certainly paid attention to this particular topic. Uh, it's, been, it's been in almost every legislative session for about the last 20 years now. And uh, during this last session, uh, Senator Bob Erbley uh, came up with the idea and, and he talked to a lot of people, including us, about can we find some middle ground? Can we find a compromise? And, and kind of settled on an electronic posting study. It sounds easy, but it's not that easy. Uh, electronic posting means you put it online, and Brian's going to explain what's coming there. But they really, they really came to a conclusion that three counties, which would be Ramsey, Slope, and uh, Richland counties, would be the pilot studies on this. And as far as uh, the meeting or the, the committee was supposed to meet, I think it was April 14th or 15th, and of course, with the coronavirus pandemic, uh, they they postponed that meeting. In fact, I just talked to Senator Herbley this afternoon, and he's not sure when the next one's going to be. They've had to make similar adjustments to everybody else in, in dealing with this issue, but we want to get something out uh, to, to the landowners, knowing that uh, this is an exceptionally busy time of the year for us, but Brian, I'm going to turn it over to you to uh, explain uh, what you and IT have come up with. Brian? Thanks, Terry. So yes, on the uh, on the uh, electronic posting update here, um, we there's some uncertainty here, but the the next interim legislative natural resource committee we expect would happen sometime in May here. Um, again, we're we're kind of. Uh, challenged here to, to get this information out and have some time for landowners to make use of it um, with some of the uh, COVID-19 delays here. Um, also, we've had with the COVID-19 updates here, we've had um, that NDIT resources have been uh, um, definitely uh, uh, have been pulled in this direction. So we're, we're looking at leveraging some of the, the pieces we had in our online licensing system to help uh, get this thing on track and, and get something out there that we can use for this pilot study. Um, we expect that this application uh, is to be completed um, by mid-May. And so again, we want to uh, try to get some information out there and, and put these on the websites to uh, to give an update on that when when folks can expect to see that and go and go uh, make use of that. Um, Terry did mention that these do include Slope, Ramsey, and Richland counties. Um, what we're really looking at here is a is a proof of concept of using this electronic posting system. So for uh, getting into the application, uh, using it, clicking on the particular lands to uh, to post them, if that's a uh, Finding that that uh, usability of that application, if that's something that uh, is is feasible for the for an, an additional posting option in the future. So, how will this work for landowners? Um, you know, electronic the electronic posting system will be available for resident landowners, tenants, or authorized individuals. Uh, we're basically extending the same type of uh, usability with the uh, physical posting options here. Um, these can all this can be accessed from the Game and Fish Department's online uh, online service or online system here. Um, those that uh, that are new to the uh, new the system, they can create a new profile, uh, first name, last name, date of birth, and uh, can get in here to use this um, and, and maybe at the time purchase a, a hunting or fishing license if you haven't done so before. Um, going back to the uh, those that are familiar with it, uh, we, we anticipate there are, are a lot of uh, 
landowners that have uh, used our system before. This is something that will be on the uh, your account where you go purchase a license, apply for a lottery, register a boat, or purchase a magazine. On that landing page, there'll be a section for land parcels for electronic posting. Um, basically, how that's going to work is uh, it's going to search county tax parcels. This uh, this system is heavily reliant upon that county tax parcel information. And so when you go search that county tax parcel information with either the, the owner name or a parcel ID number, it'll associate those particular records, those tax records back with your profile. And once that is done, you can make any uh, posting designations on that, those particular records um, on uh, you know as many as you wish. So um, with those designations, once you do so, um, you will have the option to provide any uh, alternate contact information you may have. So for example, like uh, an email or a phone number. So there'll be an option for that. Or if you have an, an alternate contact uh, entirely, maybe a, a renter or some other uh, authorized individual that you have to, to uh, um, place on there for communication contact here. How will this work for those seeking access? Um, the Game and Fish Department will provide some printable maps. Um, we do have, uh, we do this for our annual plots guide. So these are basically PDF files that those that do not have the, the devices out in the field with them, they can print these off or, or have these printed or download these and print them or have these printed somewhere, an individual map sheet or as many as they wish, um, showing these designations of these particular lands. Um, that's one option. The other, another option here is we do already have uh, several map applications on the website as well. Um, so these could also be used and they, they will display these, these lands and as well as other information on there if there's uh, any contact information. So um, a question that came in from, from last night was, uh, are these applications Android or iOS? Um, they will work on both. So there's, uh, we do have uh, ArcGIS Explorer, which uh, can be used on either. And there are some uh, browser-based applications too. Um, and in addition to these, you know, some of these printable maps could also be used on GPS units. So um, yes, it could work, work on either of those. Um, also, there's a, we're also working with some other map vendors that that many are familiar with, like with Onyx or ND Tracks. They are they are consumers of this information too, of of a lot of state uh, state and federal lands, and and so we've uh, we've been working with them to see if they would be interested in displaying some of this uh, pilot study uh, data as well. So some questions and answers here, if. If my land is located in one of the pilot study counties, am I required to use the electronic posting system to post my land? Um, we have had some questions come in and some discussions like these. Um, the answer is no. This is this is an this is optional. Um, we do encourage people to to explore this and uh, really evaluate the system. But uh, this is again this is another another option to really really determine uh, the feasibility or the uh, the use of this system uh, for the future. Um, another question we have here is, uh, will the application have the ability to change posting by date, season, critter? A lot. We've seen a lot of questions, and there's been a lot of discussion on this. Um, you know, we some are asking if uh, you know they can uh, post some lands during deer season, but not for the remainder of the season, or for uh, certain weeks during the season or weekends, um, or by critter. And while those are all uh, nice features. Um, you know, to, to really uh, help the success of this, it's probably best to start simple and, uh, and ease into some of this um, and definitely not overcomplicate this. There, there, there's definitely going to be some, some, uh, some challenges with the underlying data to run this. Um, there is an ongoing statewide GIS parcel project um, where counties are, the state is aggregating some of this county tax information. So it's going to take some time for that those uh, systems to come together and that data to mature. Um, and I think once that does occur, um, some of these more dynamic features to to explore uh, would be a little more feasible at that time. 
Um, but definitely at this time, I think it'd be recommended that uh, that we ease into this and, and kind of move along slowly here. Um, another question here, if, uh, if I use electronic posting option, well, I need to physically post my lands during the study. And this is a good question that the short answer is yes, you will. So um, current state law provides that private land is open to hunting unless the landowner, tenant, or authorized individual posts it with signs notifying hunters. The land is closed to access unless permission is obtained. So yes, these, these laws still apply to those participating in the study. And again, the study is gonna, will evaluate the usability um, of that application to post lands. And so if the, if electronic posting is determined to be a viable solution um, for the future, uh, for future posting option, I think at that time, you know, law, you know, lawmakers will will draft and propose legislation to fully implement um, all the options, and that would include all the penalties and violations at that time. But um, at this point, we're really just uh, evaluating the the idea here and the the option for uh, for an electronic posting uh, solution here. So um, we are also working with. Uh, we will get some more of these questions and answers out again when we get some of the messaging out and get closer to releasing some of this uh, these uh, the system. Um, uh, Game Fish will be working with the Department of Ag to to provide some uh, direction on how to use these systems and where to go, uh, uh, where you can go to to post lands or any other questions you may have on there. So um, we expect we again with the with the crunch we have going on here. Um, definitely want to try to get that information out as quickly as possible. Um, one of the questions that came in from last night was, uh, uh, will, will there be a deadline to participate in the study? And, and the answer to that is uh, yes, uh, there'll be, we're, we're trying to extend that as long as we can back to July 15th. So we're hoping that gives folks a couple months to, uh, to go in there and designate some of these lands. Um, the reasoning for that is, is we have, uh, there are some paper or with those uh, printable maps, it does say, take some time to create some of those things. We want to have those uh, those maps created uh, prior to the opening of some of the hunting seasons in August here. So um, we are pushing that back, but I think ideally, um, if this were something to move forward in the future, um, this is something that could open up as early as, uh, you know, maybe beginning of February and, and close it in, in July. So giving some, some adequate time or some more time to uh, make these designations on these lands. Um, with that, are there any other, any other questions? Yeah, Brian, we have a few questions for you. Are you piloting in areas with no cellular coverage or no online tax parcel information? Uh, to answer that, it's maybe we need to clarify some of that. The um, when you're making your designation, that is done on an application on the internet. So that's a that's not something that's uh, you're taking out in the field with you on a mobile application. That's something that's just like any other form or application you fill out online. Um, for those that are using this data to the mapping side of this. Um, Yes, there's some there's some of those vendor derived products like Onyx. They do have an offline mode. Um, some of the, for example, some of the printable PDF maps, um, those could be uploaded to a GPS, so you wouldn't need cellular service. Um, some of the other ones like the uh, ArcGIS Explorer, some of the browser based ones, they would they would need cell service to work. So. Um, the good news is, is uh, although we may not have coverage everywhere uh, and there's definitely holes, uh, there's there's usually a spot you can get to to get some kind of service to check on some lands there. So and I'm sure that'll continue to improve over the years for us. Brian, another question. Will e-posting be an annual event? Oh, that's a yes, that's a good question. Um, yes, this is something that that would need to be done annually. Um, we uh, with the changing tax data, this is something that we would uh, refresh as often as we can. And then uh, for any sales of land or purchase of lands, uh, we'd expect that uh, those posting would come in at that time of year. And we're hoping that this system uh, is is easy enough that it's uh, kind of like what we're doing with our licensing system. We want people to get in and out and make their designations. So. 
Another question, Brian, can I change my selection if it is before the deadline? Yes, you can. So if you right now, if we were going to pick July 15th for this deadline um, and you made your designation today and then wanted to come back next week, you could still go in there and, and change that designation until we uh, cut that off. And again, we the, the reason why we want to have that deadline is so we can take a snapshot of that information and really help out those that do not are not using those those devices and those technologies. Uh, give them a means just like we do the plot sky today. Give them a means to use those maps to uh, identify some of these locations and lands. Another last question actually for you, Brian, at this time, what information will be displayed if I post my lands with this system? OK, um, yes, that uh, again, we're trying to we're trying to mimic what exist on the physical signage today. So uh, by law now you have to provide a first and last name. And so that's by default that information would come over um, on there. Now you also have the option to add an addition additional information additional information such as a phone number or an email address. Um, or you also have an option to provide an alternate point of contact. So whatever you provide in that with that alternate point of contact, whether it be name and phone number and email, uh, that's the information that would be displayed on the on the uh, on the mapping systems. OK. No other questions for uh, for Brian. So um, good evening, everybody. You're obviously looking at a different face up here, so Allow me to introduce myself. I'm Scott Peterson. I'm deputy director here at uh, North Dakota Game and Fish and and uh, director Steinwan and I will be doing a little tag teaming for the remainder of the event. The next uh, item on our agenda is a a wildlife uh, division related uh, presentation. We're going to have Jeb Williams come up and, and give you some updates. Jeb is our wildlife division chief and among other things, Jeb's going to uh, give you an update on our bighorn sheep management program. He's going to give you an update on an elk research study that's been underway in the western part of the state. And then he's also going to give you a, a presentation, an update on the status of the Conservation Reserve Program makers in North Dakota. So with that, Jeb, it's all yours. Thanks, Scott. Good evening, everyone. I do have an update from, from, uh, from the Wildlife Division. I do have a, a short presentation, but before I get to that, I do, uh, like I said, just want to give a, a brief update to, uh, to folks across the state about the about the good work that uh, this three sections of the Wildlife Division have still been doing. Um, um, basically, all the all the items and responsibilities that the Wildlife Division is responsible uh, for has has been conducted as close to normal as possible. The Wildlife Resource Management section, which is responsible for managing our state's 220,000 acres approximately of wildlife management areas all across our, our state. Uh, those are all open for business. Um, we're glad about that. We think it's an excellent opportunity to promote those areas as people need some outdoor time. They need some extra outdoor recreation. We have spring turkey season currently going on. We know many of those areas across the state um, provide good numbers of, of uh, wild turkeys for people to, uh, uh, to use as public land areas for that pursuit. So all those areas are currently open right now as we speak. And, and again, we're, we're pretty proud of that. Our guys are out doing a lot of field work, spring field work as uh, as we normally do. Uh, practicing, of course, uh, a lot of social distancing. So that's a little bit different, but uh, our normal day to day work schedule has been as close to the same as possible. Our game management section, which is responsible for uh, all the season setting information, research, survey work, all that has been going on as scheduled. Uh, mule deer survey was just complete. Um, did take a little bit longer. Uh, we did have a little bit of a smaller crew associated with our, our our mule deer survey this year, so it took took a little bit longer due to again a smaller crew, and we had, had to battle some uh, wind out there too. So uh, when you're using those uh, small airplanes, wind does get to be an issue in spring of the year. No doubt we do get wind in North Dakota, but all in all that. Uh, was complete and, and got a really good picture, I guess, as far as what the Badlands looks like. And I will talk about that in, in my presentation as we move forward. Our private lands program, which most people are familiar with, which is known for as our PLATS program. Um, 
most of our, our private lands biologists are working remotely, but that really hasn't slowed them down. A lot of that work that they conduct with private landowners is done uh, over the phone, through email, through uh, electronic communication anyway. And so a lot of that work is continuing uh, as normal and as planned. And so we're excited about that and we'll be excited to announce some increase of uh, our plots acres across the state for this year. So all in all, just uh, wanted to give folks a, a brief update from the wildlife division overall that things are, are progressing uh, quite well. About the only thing that we were not able to accomplish this year, which we were a little disappointed in was our uh, sage grouse project, which we've been working with the state of Wyoming uh, for the last three years. Um, that, that project did get uh, put on pause for a year where we have been getting sage grouse from Wyoming, bringing them back to Southwest North Dakota and attempt to bolster mm -hmm. that population. Uh, due to the COVID situation, that permit did get, uh, like I said, put on hold for a year, but we plan on resuming that next year. So all in all, uh, things have been going quite well and, and uh, we hope to gather the information that's important to the public when it gets to all the information we have to provide. So uh, having said all that, I'm gonna move into a presentation. And one of the things that most people will be familiar with is um, when we talk, talking at spring advisory board meetings is we're usually talking about our deer proclamation. So for the 2020 deer proclamation that has been delivered to the governor and is under his consideration at this time, so it is still a proposal, but our proposal does include an increase of licenses uh, from last year for a total of 69,050 licenses, which is um, approximately 3,500 increase from 2019. So that's a positive thing. This is the fifth consecutive year now that we have been um, moving upward with our deer licenses in the state. And so we feel good about that versus uh, the curve we we're on from 2010 to 2015, which was a straight downward trend. And so now we're, we're seeing that spike back up. And so we feel good about that. We feel good about the opportunities that are gonna, that have been out there for the deer hunting public and more opportunities out there in this coming year as well. Uh, just a reminder to folks, the application deadline is June 3rd. So we are right on schedule for getting those as soon as, as soon as the proclamation is officially approved and signed by Governor Burgum, the applications will go online. Um, the first, uh, I think it's right around May 7th or so, May 8th is when we kind of had it in place. And so those are gonna go online as soon as we, uh, as soon as we receive word from Governor Burgum that the proclamation is signed. Um, just a reminder out there too, landowner licenses, gratis license uh, folks have been able to apply since May 3rd. The department did make that, excuse me, since April, April 1st, um, department did make that change a couple years back, just giving landowners a little extra time to get their applications in, understanding they have a pretty busy time of year right now with whether it be calving, uh, farming or both, and just give, uh, give landowners extra time to get their gratis application in, which also helps the, the general sportsmen out as far as us getting all those applications into the system earlier on. Enforcement division can do all their checks and then after all that is said and done, we can get those uh, license results out to deer hunters that much earlier. And so as, as most of you have noticed the last couple of years, it has been uh, three, three and a half weeks earlier uh, than what has previously been. So um, I think people have been appreciative about that. Anytime we can get results out sooner, um, people definitely do appreciate that. Um, just a quick update on mule deer units. I did touch on that a little bit earlier as far as our mule deer survey. Uh, mule deer uh, licenses are gonna stay the same from last year, although that doesn't mean all units are staying the same. We did see an increase in mule deer licenses north of the interstate in unit 4B, and we, also, and we are gonna have a reduction in mule deer license in south of the interstate in 4D. And, and that does really, uh, really line up with what we heard last year at our advisory board meeting in Belfield from both uh, landowners and hunters alike that mule deer numbers in the, in the southern badlands south of Medora uh, weren't probably as good as what they'd been seeing in the previous year. So we're gonna back off on that area a little bit, but the area north of the interstate um, continues to be rebound very nicely and we did see really good numbers overall. So uh, we're happy about the mule deer situation out in the western part of the state. A couple other thing, notable things for our proclamation, and, and, and I should say back up a little too, is that we did, for the proclamation this year, just due to all the things going on, we did want to have a maybe a more simple proclamation versus a complex proclamation, being, 
things number one, we weren't going to get a chance to, to visit face to face with the public and talk about a lot of different issues that we normally like to talk about and, and have a little more in-depth conversation and let folks know of changes or else get their opinion on stuff, get their take on things before we make the change. Um, but we did we did include a couple of herd reduction areas um, in our in our proclamation. A lot of folks are probably familiar with the herd reduction areas that we currently have in Bismarck, South Amanda and at the experiment station uh, in the city of Minot and then the city of Fargo as well. And we did include one north of Bismarck and then south of Mandan. And these areas are challenging areas when it comes to managing deer. It's very good deer, white-tailed deer habitat, but with urban sprawl uh, development going on around these areas, it's very difficult to manage deer with the rifle. And so we are uh, trying to target these areas with um, a little more aggressive management with these herd reduction areas uh, through the youth use of archery season and antlerless licenses. So we've been uh, discussing this with an issue Bowman here in, in Bismarck and looking at some youth opportunities possibly for getting these individuals out on these lands, helping the landowners out with these uh, abundant deer and then also getting some youth opportunities available there too. So that's going to be a change that people will see in our in this year's proclamation, the addition of those two herd reduction areas. So just a, a, a simple little graph again, talking about where we've been the last 10 years with, with deer licenses. In 2010, we were right around that 200, or excuse me, 114,000 um, license mark. And then as I mentioned earlier too, we really dropped out and hit, a, hit about a 30 year low in 2015 at 43,000 licenses. Now we're slowly working our way back up. And like I said, this year, we're gonna be right around that 69,000 mark. And, and starting next year too, we're also gonna be starting on our, our five-year goals for, for deer management in North Dakota, which is something that we've been doing since the early 2000s. And so that's gonna start the new process of where we wanna be and maybe looking at doing things a little bit different in a few units as far as some CWD management goes and looking at some potential license changes and. Um, one of the things we continue to hear a lot about too that we might roll into that discussion is, you know, as uh, mule deer uh, archery opportunities in the Badlands, is it time to, to maybe look at, you know, some extra protections available out there for, uh, for mule deer and, and instead of over the counter opportunities. Those are all things we're hearing about from the public and, and those are things we can roll into that discussion as we, as we move, move forward. One of the things we did want to bring up was last last fall, I thought we had a really good discussion with you folks at uh, at our advisory board meetings in the in the fall of the year around the state, discussing our, our bighorn sheep population south of the interstate. This has been a population down in the southern Badlands area, the Bullion Butte area, uh, for you know since approximately 1985. And and long story short, the 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 herd down there has has never done extremely well. It's it's kind of just uh, um, rolled along, but it's it's had some challenges with disease, and and so right now there's a population of about 20 sheep. One of the, one of the things we talked about was using hunters to remove those sheep and bring in healthy sheep uh, from the source uh, it, that we have available to us from the Rocky Boy Indian Reservation in Montana. Um, we are gonna we are pushing the pause button on this project just due to some surveys and inventories we did of the area. The two release sites that we had in mind, the best area in the Southern Badlands, um, when we did the inventories, one of the things we're looking for is, is domestic sheep populations in those areas. Um, wild sheep are known to wander in and mingle with domestic sheep and domestic sheep can often be carriers of uh, uh, a certain bacteria that, that are, that's deadly to bighorn sheep. And so if, if that one single ram mingles with those domestic sheep, it's not just that single ram that can potentially die. It's it's the herd when that when that ram goes back into that herd. So we, we don't feel it'd be responsible at this point in time to bring in healthy to remove the sheep in the southern badlands and then bring in healthy sheep to that situation that we have going on. So we've hit the pause button. We haven't taken it off the table, but we'll be evaluating it as as uh, time moves on. Our Western elk study is, is a, something we've been receiving a lot of questions about, people very interested in it, uh, as are we. When the, the herd reduction was done in the south unit of Theodore Roosevelt National Park in 2009, 2010, right around those years, 
we didn't really know for sure what the Western North Dakota would look like as far as elk numbers, but elk have done quite well uh, moving north of uh, South Dinor to Theodore Roosevelt National Park and have really established good home territories in many different areas. And so we, we needed to learn more about their movements. We needed to learn more about where they're spending their time. And we wanted to learn more to help us better manage those critters with a, uh, a better systematic approach to our survey methodology, similar to what we have for our mule deer population. So this has been something that we are very excited about. Last year, uh, there were 90 elk that were collared, 70 collared cows, 20 collared bulls. And this really gives us a large sample size to, to look at a lot of the different things in, in, a compli in, in the goals of the study that I just mentioned. So we're, we're very excited about that, about the opportunity that this research project is going to give us. So a couple of couple takeaways, I guess, just within a little over a year and a couple months of what we've seen so far, we, we certainly do have some good seasonal movements that are in place. And, you know, that's important to know when we when we look at, you know, hunting seasons, boundaries, different things like that. Um, one of the things, too, we also received in the first year of the information there, we did have a low recovery rate, uh, harvest rate of the of the animals that were collared. Uh, only 11 collars had to be put back on animals this year, which, you know, shows we have a good number of elk out there and we have issues of, of getting to those elk as far as harvest goes. So the, the, the survival rate was was really high for the number of collared animals out there. Um, identifying high impact areas. That's something that, you know, is a definitely a goal of our study when we're working with private landowners, when we're looking at qualifying private landowners for gratis elk licenses. Maybe there are some landowners out there that, um, you know, are experiencing more impact than others. This is the research project where we can elk, let elk essentially do the work for us and show us where they're spending the most time. So within the, the first year and approximately three months, we have received a ton of information and on the slide you can see here a couple areas over into Montana where we have movement in Montana um, that north of that Weibo country and then we also have uh, had one young bull elk that sometimes they do this they end up wandering quite a ways and he took quite the roundabout path all the way down and it's been spending time in, in Riva, South Dakota so really interesting uh, work and information that's going on project set to be completed in 2022 and 23 with the, with the final uh, report writing done at that point in time. So stay tuned for more updates on, on this really neat project. I'll wrap up with uh, a really important program in North Dakota that's that sometimes gets, gets confused as a North Dakota Game and Fish Department program, but it's not. Uh, Conservation Reserve Program, the CRP, is a, is a federal program that's administered by the the federal FSA and this has been an extremely popular program for wildlife enthusiasts in North Dakota since its inception in 1985. Uh, we experienced a high of CRP acres in the year of 2008 with approximately 3.2 million acres of uh, CRP on the landscape across North Dakota which did wonderful things for both birds and deer and we've over the since that time we've been on a, on a decline as far as CRP acres. So we're going to end up in uh, this year uh, with approximately 1.2 million acres. And so that's, uh, again, a pretty uh, considerable loss of high quality habitat since that 2008 peak. And, and that's tough to make up for. And, and one of the challenges with it is we know there's been landowners out there that have had high interest in signing up for CRP. The last couple general signups, though, have not been um, have not been real good, I guess, as far as accepting a lot of these offers that North Dakota's had and, and South Dakota has even been quite a bit worse as far as those offers accepted. Uh, this year with the general signup that just uh, was just announced or just complete, 140,000 acres were offered to producers. We don't know for sure if that total amount will be um, accepted by producers. Um, so, I mean, that's it's good news. Uh, it's probably a little more than we expected. It's better than we've done in, in previous general signups. Um, but I guess the point of this, too, is just to point out, not to be too much of a, uh, of a pessimist, but we're, we're still losing that battle. In 2020, there's going to be 185,000 acres that are actually expiring in 2020. So we're hopeful in these next couple of years, there's going to be additional general CRP signups and 
And, uh, you know, maybe maybe the tide has turned a little bit as we did see better success this year for landowners wanting to get in the program and we're actually accepted. So uh, we do feel fairly good about that. One of the things that the plots program can do is we can piggyback on top of that program. And again, it's it's something that's looked at as a very high quality habitat program. People know when they're going to a plots track that has CRP on it, they're going to um, they're going to encounter some really good habitat conditions and we want to help with that. We have some good incentives out there where the department will pay an additional $10 per acre on top of that CRP contract that is offered to that landowner. And we have private lands biologists uh, scattered all throughout the state that are willing to help with with you with that, whether it's new CRP, whether it is a uh, renewal contracts or other may be interested in other plots uh, programs with the department just really encourage you to contact any of our private lands biologists that can help you with any of your conservation interests. Uh, just the one last thing to touch on our the 2020 goal for the private lands program is 810,000 acres and that's a real positive as we've been in the, the 700s now for the last number of years but one of the reasons that is is you know we're still concentrating uh, based on input from the public that it's, it's not necessarily about the numbers, but it's, it's about the quality of habitat that's on the landscape. And our folks out in the field have been doing a very nice job of ensuring and making sure that the acres are enrolled are, uh, are generally speaking high quality habitat, as we know that's what the public appreciates and what they want to see when they get out on the landscape. So uh, we, are, we are moving the needle and appreciate all the interest we've been receiving from landowners and working with all uh, landowners across the state, that relationship is critical and uh, we feel like we're moving in a, in a positive direction. So having said all that, I uh, appreciate your time and I will stand for any questions that, uh, that you might have. A few questions, Jeb, and I believe you touched on this one a little bit. Has there been discussion on limiting archery tags directed at mule deer? having a mule deer archery tag separate from the over-the-counter any deer archery tag. He says he thinks it would do wonders for opportunity and less hunter pressure out west. Well, yeah, to answer that question, like I, I visited about before, I, I think that it would be a good opportunity for the department to use our, our five-year deer goals, even though that is that is that is more so related to our rifle licenses, but it is also a good opportunity to talk about deer and deer management. And we continue to hear comments like the one that you just that you just read about. And this this a lot of a lot of it's coming from archers themselves is feeling that the quality of opportunity has diminished over the years with uh, the badland situation with mule deer opportunities and and really a situation where there, it might be might be the time to look at uh, some type of a system to where it, it better protects the quality hunting opportunity out there for mule deer. I mean, one of the things I should say with that too is we don't, I mean, we don't feel this is a biological issue. I mean, we have the safeguard in place as obviously with our surveys that we do and, you know, the buck to doe ratio, we're able to adjust that, you know, through rifle licenses. But that also gets to be a fairness issue too if if the if the rifle hunter should be the one that get that adjustment and, and the archery hunters don't and so but we do we do not see it as, as a necessarily as a biological issue it's more much more of a social issue and but we are hearing from more and more people about the uh, uh, about the crowds i guess maybe for lack of better uh, terminology associated with uh, archery hunting in the badlands Another question, Jeff, does Game and Fish have any plans to adopt proof of sex field dressing laws similar to other Western states to limit the spread of CWD? Uh, that, that's a good question, and, and yes, we do. Uh, that, that is something that we are going to be working on, and people can look forward to seeing some information from us over the next year as far as giving some flexibilities to our current law to where people do not have to take the head with as far as the proof of sex, proof of species that currently is in place right now. So we intend to get some information out to the public over the next year and have something in place next year for our, our 2021 deer proclamation on that very issue. Jeff, switching gears to the elk population, he wants to know how is the elk population doing in the Turtle Mountains in unit E1W? Uh, doing, doing quite well. That, that's a, it, it's a challenging area. Uh, up there, uh, we have an obvious uh, 
border up there, the Canadian border that does get to be challenging. We actually uh, assisted the Canadian Wildlife Service a couple years ago and flew some of that area out over into the into, into Canada just to get a better picture of what was going on. And, and there's no shortage of elk up there. We've been working with a number of landowners up there to to, to address the elk issues in that area. And it's, it's a very challenging issue due to the number of elk, due to the, the wooded habitat, due to the Canadian border, um, and due to when those elk are actually spending time in the United States. And so it's uh, it has been a challenging issue for us, but we're, again, we're working with a few landowners up there that have been very, uh, very helpful with us. Uh, one this year actually recommended extending our season, which we did in our proclamation for that for that unit area, which would give a little extra time for hunters late in the season to be able to address the issue of those elk coming back and forth uh, across the uh, international border. Final question, Jeff. What is being done to aggressively recreate lost grassland and shelter, bed, shelter belt habitat on the landscape in Dickey County? We have lost nearly all the grass and trees due to conversation to cropland, and this leaves a denuded and monocultural landscape that is not good for wildlife nor ecosystems. Voluntary plot enrollments don't seem to be adequate to salvage dwindling wildlife populations, including upland, big game, and waterfall. Well, there's that's there's a lot there <laughs> um, to that, but. I guess I'll go back, jump back a little bit and talk about about CRP and, and, and talk about the value of CRP. So when we had that high of, you know, 3.2 million acres in North Dakota, and like I mentioned, it's a federal program. And so an at, on our annual peak in North Dakota for CRP payments, the federal government paying landowners was approximately $130 million annually for CRP payments. Um, that's simply something the department cannot compete with when it comes to budget wise. We're doing all we can from a plot standpoint. It just gets to be a budget issue for the department to be able to uh, recreate um, essentially a CRP program. And we can do that in localized areas, but we don't we can't do that budget wise from a statewide perspective. And, uh, you know, we're doing all we can to partner with different conservation organizations to make the dollars go as absolute uh, uh, far as we can to putting habitat on the ground um, where we have landowners that are that are willing to do that too. So there have been some good programs, whether, you know, we're talking about, um, you know, Pheasants Forever doing some work with, with uh, private landowners that are addressing some of those areas that are not the best uh, farmland, cropland areas and using those areas as conservation areas. Um, you know, those are the type of the targeted programs that are, um, that are that's kind of the name of the game right now and using those dollars the best we can in a targeted way. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Jeb. Uh, next on our agenda, we're going to hear from Dr. Charlie Banson. And uh, Charlie is our staff wildlife veterinarian and Charlie is going to give you an update uh, on a, a topic that uh, is of some interest to a lot of other big game hunters in the state of North Dakota, and that is uh, of the chronic wasting disease. And so with that, Charlie, take it away. All right, thank you very much. Um, yeah, chronic wasting disease has been a concern for our department for a while and will continue to be a concern, um, but I want to be upfront and say that um, that pales in comparison to our level of concern for the health and safety of North Dakotans. And so um, with that being said, I know that the level of familiarity with a lot of these disease concepts is quite a lot um, higher than it was a couple of months ago. And so hopefully this can be somewhat of a, a nice distraction, albeit a morbid one from, from what's going on right now. Um, I also know that there's been a number of questions that we've had emailed and, and um, messaged to us, so I'll try to provide some, some helpful information for that. Uh, but, but ultimately, I hope that we can all get back to thinking more about deer hunting and, and deer health in the near future. So chronic wasting disease is a disease that can affect moose, elk, and, and deer, but we'll primarily talk about um, how it applies to deer. We know that deer can be infected through a variety of ways. They can be 
infected through direct contact with, with another animal that's, that's infected, but they can also be infected through indirect contact with, with contact through the urine, saliva, feces of, of an infected animal. Um, and we also know that infected carcasses left out on the landscape can be a source of infection even for years after the carcass breaks down. Regardless of, of how that happens, um, we know that in 18 to 20 months, that deer really becomes a skeleton, so to speak. Um, it's emaciated, it's salivating, it's unaware of its surroundings, and it will die. It's a 100% fatal disease. Part of the challenge though is what happens in between, what this deer looks like, and, and that's just a perfectly healthy deer. And so, you know, even though it's on a one-way track to, to this end stage, it's interacting with other deer and, and potentially infecting them. Its bodily fluids are, are infectious, and presumably it can also spread the disease to new areas, either on hoof or on in the back of a truck. We also know that uh, there is this, this end stage mortality, but, but there is sort of a spectrum or a slow decline in function that, that comes somewhere before this. And so the rate of infection or the rate of mortality increases in positive deer due to other factors. Um, predation increases in infected deer. Uh, they're more likely to be hit by cars and, and presumably they're just less adept at navigating all the challenges that, that our deer face. In terms of the, the major points of CWD, there is unfortunately no treatment. We don't have a vaccine and it is 100% fatal. And unfortunately, there's also not a reliable way to test live animals, which presents a lot of challenges. But, you know, why do we care? Why, why does it matter? Well, you know, when CWD first comes into an area, it's pretty easy to, to dismiss its importance and, and really write it off as, as a curiosity. And that's because you have this one infected deer among a herd. Unfortunately, we know that with time, this is an infectious disease. So, so it begins to spread in a herd, again, through that direct contact, through that, that indirect contact with bodily fluids, the rate slowly over time increases to where you can have a really alarmingly high rate of infection in that herd. And so what does it look like when you have a large portion of your deer with this fatal disease? Well, we really don't have to speculate anymore. We have a number of, of studies that have, that have looked into this. I'll just point out that these are a few examples of, of scientific research projects that have been vetted by experts and in, in peer reviewed and published in academic journals. And so, you know, th this is really the foundation on which science rests and, and what we look to uh, to understand this disease. Um, so we'll look at a couple of, of the um, papers that I show here. Um, in Wyoming, this, this really well-defined herd in, in Southeast Wyoming, they looked at the the white-tailed deer and the mule deer, and just looking at some hard numbers. In the mule deer, they had a, a prevalence or an infection rate of 24%, so a quarter of the deer were infected. They found that compared to uninfected deer, the infected deer were 2.8 times more likely to die each year. And so if you combine these two numbers, you're looking at a annual mortality or a population decline of, of 21%. Looking at the white-tailed deer, there was a 35% prevalence. Those infected deer were four and a half times more likely to die each year, and that equated to an annual population decline of 10.4%. So CWD can cause really alarming long-term population level effects. You know, that being said, it's still kind of hard to get your idea or your mind around kind of those, those big catastrophic level effects that are somewhere down the road. And so let's look at kind of another way to think about this. And, uh, you know, I apologize, this is a kind of a schematic, um, but, but, you know, ultimately deer management in essence is not terribly complicated. And I guess that's what I'm apologizing for is because I know all the game and fish staff are squirming in their chairs, but, but really in essence, it's not complicated. You know, you have your, your deer population that kind of consists of this stable population that, that every year produces this surplus. And, and it's this surplus that we can 
comfortably harvest every year, removed from the landscape, and, and yet the stable population generates an, a new crop every year that, that again provides this surplus and it's, it's a year after year cycle. Now, we know that there are good years and bad years. You know, you might have a really hard winter that takes its toll. You might have another disease that comes in and, and works its way through the herd, uh, like hemorrhagic disease. And so again, there are ups and downs. There are good years and bad years. Um, but the problem is that we know that when CWD comes into the area, it becomes this, this stable year after year after year cause of mortality. You know, there are not good years and bad years with CWD. There are only bad years and worse years. And so that means that all of a sudden there's a heavy cut due to this new cause of mortality that, that takes its toll on this surplus. And so, you know, what does that mean? Well, it, it means that, you know, while those those big effects are further down the road or hopefully further down the road, you know, in the near term, you may you may go out hunting, you may look out the, the window and still see deer. You know, they're they're not all gone, but but there's simply fewer there and there's there's a, a smaller surplus. And so instead of multiple opportunities, maybe you only have one or two instead of choosing between a few different um, animals, you, you only get one opportunity. And, and you know, it, this will also certainly affect the age structure and, and license availability and, and other things th throughout how we, we manage deer. You know, one last thing to note too is that CWD doesn't tend to stay stable. You know, over time, it does increase in, in prevalence in a herd. And so the effect of this will increase with time. We get a lot of questions about human health and ultimately the CDC says that that right now they don't know that to their knowledge nobody has ever become sick from eating an infected deer but but they can't dismiss the possibility of that happening as, as being zero risk and so in areas where CWD is is known to exist they recommend that you strongly consider having your animal tested before you eat that meat. So CWD is really a serious threat. Where are we at in North Dakota? We know that, you know, we start first started finding positive deer in 3F2 in 2009, and we've been finding positive deer there ever since. In 2018, up in Unit 3A1, we found our first positive deer. And then unfortunately in 2019, we found positive deer in 3B1 and 4B as well. Um, our, our hunter surveillance that we conduct each year indicates that in hunter harvested adult mule deer bucks, we're looking at an infection rate of about 3% down in 3F2 and about 2% of our mule deer are infected up in 3A1. Uh, we also know that we have CWD in these areas, but we're probably earlier on in, in the course of disease there. Uh, we've also found it occasionally in white-tailed deer, but but so far it seems to to really be in a uh, phenomenon in our mule deer herd thus far. So you know, I've I've described kind of the the stark numbers and and where we're at. It's a it's a grim reality, but really, if there's any bright side, it's that most of this map is still white. You know, it's still free of CWD. And, and even where we have the disease, we're not at this point yet. We're really very much at this point. And so there's an opportunity to, to take bold action and to try to, um, to keep this thing in check and before it's too late, ultimately. Of course, there's lots of challenges with CWD. Uh, as we discussed, we don't have vaccine or treatment. We don't have these conventional tools to combat, um, you know, other diseases like bacterial or viral diseases. Once it's established in an area, it remains indefinitely. Um, you know, we know that, that the disease on the landscape can remain infectious for years, if not decades. And so, um, you know, it's considered that eradication once established is, is not really feasible. And of course, you know, I, I couldn't help myself. I had to put a disease curve on, on this presentation because we've all probably losing our minds hearing about curves, but I just wanted to illustrate that, um, you know, in a classic disease that works its way through a wildlife population, what drives this downward progression is, is population immunity, meaning that, you know, 
the number of susceptible individuals has simply decreased. And that's either because um, a large portion of the population has been infected, has recovered, and is no longer susceptible, or there's some sort of vaccine. But but ultimately, um, you know, population immunity is, is, again, like I said, what drives this downward curve. Now, we don't have that as an option for CWD. And so, um, unfortunately, our curve looks very much more like this. So again, North Dakota is somewhere down in here and it's, you know, kind of uh, the ball is in our court, so to speak, to do everything we can to, to slow down or stop how fast we progress up this curve. How do we do this? Well, well, through kind of just having a clear idea of, of our management goals and, and in principle, they're simple. You know, we want to keep CWD out of areas that don't have it. And where we do have areas uh, with CWD, we want to slow down or stop how fast we move from this scenario to this scenario. How do we do that? Well, um, we do that by identifying kind of what we know about how CWD works within our population, and then trying to identify interventions or, or ways to kind of stop the, that risk. So here we have uh, you know, your theoretical positive herd and your theoretical negative herd and and so how does you know how does this herd become infected well we know one way that 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 can happen is by moving carcass parts in the back of a truck or you know through through human movement um, you know keep in mind that for the vast majority of this 18 to 20 months there's no way to tell if this animal is infected unless you've had it tested and so hunters, you know, that are well-intentioned um, can unknowingly transport infected carcasses that, um, you know, across the landscape and in the high-risk parts, the brain and the spinal cord, if they end up on the landscape, can serve as a source of infection for, for years afterwards. And so um, right now, if, if you harvest an animal, a deer in one of these units, um, or even outside of the state in a, in a state that has confirmed CWD, the brain and the spinal cord can't come into the remainder of the state. I'll also note that there are transportation restrictions in place for moose and elk. You can find uh, similar maps um, on our webpage for that. We also know that, uh, of course, CWD can move to, from, to new areas simply on hoof. You know, deer move naturally, but we know that a major driver of, of, what, of why deer um, move to new areas is simply competition for resources. And so if we can apply, you know, healthy, sustainable um, hunter harvest to, to maintain a lower deer density, we, we reduce how much competition there is and, and we lessen that driver for, for these deer to, to move to new areas. So again, I just really want to emphasize that, that in this whole puzzle, our, our absolute best tool is, is you, the hunter, um, you know, hunter harvest. You know, we know that in areas where we have CWD, um, hunters every year will remove a number of animals and, and hopefully most of them or, or a lot of them are, are going to be negative, but some of them are positive. And so that means these are positive deer that are coming off the landscape that are no longer serving as infection, uh, as sources of infection. You know, that being said, as we as we take a look at what we do, um, we know that that if there are things out there, if we are doing things that cause these deer to, to come into close contact, we start to add risk to the, the chances of the disease spreading. Again, the longer that happens, or the more often we have these, these direct contacts, the more often deer are coming into contact with, with bodily fluids, the greater the risk. And so, um, you know, the, long, the, the more often that uh, deer are coming into contact, the longer in the calendar season that that's happening, and, uh, and the more intense these congregations are happening, meaning the more deer that you have in just these really close quarters, the greater the risk of, of this disease spreading. Another challenge with CWD is that if you have deer in, in this same area for a prolonged period of time, you have to start worrying about um, environmental contamination, meaning the urine, saliva, and feces, if concentrated in an area, can serve as a source of infection long after these deer are gone. And so, you know, even if, if all the deer um, leave, you have the potential risk of, you know, years later, animals coming into the area and becoming positive.
Now, of course, what I'm getting at, which I'm all, I'm all sure you're picking up on, is, is the baiting restriction. In these portions of North Dakota, you can't hunt over, over bait. You can't use bait to, to harvest an animal. Um, you know, we in the department certainly know that, that deer um, congregate naturally for portions of the year. We know that they yard up, that, um, you know, that they are social animals, but, but we also know that, that baiting is one thing that exacerbates that. We know that it, again, prolongs how often they're coming into contact and, and how many deer are coming into the same uh, small area. And, and so ultimately, um, you know, we as hunters are, are obligated to, um, you know, take this step to, to protect the long-term health of, of our deer herd. Now, you know, kind of closing, um, this is a puzzle, you know, and, and, but there are things that you can do to help. And, and first and foremost, uh, we need you to keep hunting. You know, hunting, as I mentioned, is our absolute best tool for, for managing healthy populations. Um, you are eyes and ears on the ground. You're, you're why you do it, and, and hunting is why, why we do it, um, do what we do. Stay informed. We have great resources uh, on our webpage. I'll point out that we also link to this uh, Association of Fish and Wildlife Agencies technical report um, that was compiled by really the world experts in, in chronic waste and disease. Um, they provide guidelines on how to manage CWD and, and most importantly, they, they reference really the robust scientific evidence uh, for why these, these management practices are, are recommended. And so this is a document that we use to guide what we do in North Dakota. And, and I really encourage you to check that out if, if you want to dig deep into, um, into good information. Stay up to date on CWD regulations. Uh, the CWD proclamation for, for this coming hunting season is, is now available. It's signed. Get your animal tested. Um, each year we, we conduct surveillance kind of throughout the state, um, including areas where we, we know we have CWD and kind of and manage for it appropriately, but then we also do rotating surveillance. And so, um, you know, please check out where we're doing surveillance. And if you're hunting in that area, um, you know, submit ahead for testing. And then finally, dispose of carcasses appropriately. Um, you know, I always say that that every deer that I harvested growing up, the after we butchered it, the remainder of the carcass ended up in my folks back 80. And, and really that's a, a practice that we need to start moving away from regardless of where you harvest your animal. Um, you know, the, the best place to, best, most feasible place to dispose of of those carcass parts are, are in a municipal solid waste landfill, which I have uh, on the map here. Um, these serve most of, really most of the um, jurisdictions throughout the state, but, but even a local landfill um, is a good way to dispose of a carcass to make sure that it's buried, um, which is just a, a much better alternative to that, those carcass parts ending up on a WMA in a ditch, um, you know, in the back 80. So dispose of carcasses appropriately. You know, wrapping up, um, just kind of want to reemphasize that, that this is a serious issue and, and hopefully you have can come to appreciate that after what we've discussed. Um, you know, and it, it's an issue that, that's not going away. Um, it will require really sustained diligence on, on our part and, and, and often some of these things involve inconvenience for folks or, or really major sacrifice for others. Um, and we're, we're cer certainly sensitive to that, but but really ultimately our only chance to, to have a, you know, a, a chance of keeping CWD in check is, is if we can collectively agree that, that the herd is worth protecting and, and that we all really have responsibility for, um, you know, taking up the cause. So my name again is Charlie Bonson. I'm the wildlife veterinarian for the department um, and you can find my contact information on our webpage and, and here as well. And so you know, I encourage you if you have questions or want to chat about this, please uh, do reach out to me. I'm, I'm one of many people in the department that are happy to talk to you about um, CWD. So uh, thank you for your time and, and I'd love to stumble through a, a couple of questions. Charlie, there are some questions for you. Great. One is, what, 
What's the consequence of paying a deer from the CWD unit or from out of state to a taxidermist? I'm sorry, Greg, can you repeat that? I didn't quite hear it. Yeah, what's the concern of bringing a deer from a CWD unit or from out of state to a taxidermist? Sure. Um, you know, so first and foremost, I just want to say that taxidermists in North Dakota uh, have been and continue to be just phenomenal uh, collaborators in this effort. And so I really want to, you know, acknowledge their help and, and um, you know, thank them and, and, and thank those of you who, uh, who use them. Um, now, you know, there's been discussion in our department and, and there's been discussion with us among taxidermists about, um, you know, potentially developing some sort of system um, that I think the question is getting at. Um, right now, our, our transportation restrictions are, are aimed at keeping those high-risk carcass parts, the, the brain and spinal cord or spinal column, you know, in the area where we know we have CWD. Um, now, now, it's possible that we could develop some sort of system where, where there's an exemption for uh, for whole carcasses ending up in kind of these designated areas, you know, a taxidermist um, who who has the proper training and, and proper, um, you know, comply or ha proper material or excuse me, proper supplies to make sure that that material is is disposed of appropriately. Um, you know, that being said, some a system like that would uh, for us to be comfortable would involve just a um, some concerns about compliance and, and training, and, and that would come at a pretty significant um, expense in terms of, um, you know, uh, time and, and personnel. And so, you know, again, I, I think that there's a feasible way to make that work, but but it's in conversation at this point, and, and I kind of welcome uh, those of you with ideas to, um, to chat with us and, and see where we can, we can get with the idea. Here's a two-part question, Charlie. Sweet. Is CWD transmissible from wildlife such as deer or moose to domestic livestock? In addition, also, what would type what type of diseases can be transmitted to livestock from wildlife that livestock caretakers should be aware of? Sure. Um, so yeah, those are that is a good two-part question. Um, you know, there's there have been a number of studies that have looked at the possibility of, um, you know, whether domestic livestock and um, predominantly cattle, but they've looked at other species, um, if they're susceptible to CWD. And uh, boy, in these studies, they've really, they've really tried to hammer cattle with CWD. And it looks like uh, there's a pretty strong species barrier. It looks like at the moment, CWD is, is pretty well uh, confined to cervids, those moose, elk, deer, um, you know, species like that. So, so for the time being, it, it looks like domestic livestock are fairly safe. Um, the other question is, you know, almost a separate lecture. And so I'll go ahead and talk for another hour. Uh, no, but the other question about transmissible diseases, um, you know, there, there are a number of diseases that, that we definitely keep an eye out that are, that are a risk of transmitting um, really between livestock and wildlife. And, and there's good examples of, of that direction going either way. Um, you know, one, one example is tuberculosis, uh, bovine tuberculosis. Another example is, is um, brucellosis. Uh, as I mentioned, we, we really go to great lengths to make sure that our wildlife are free of both those diseases. And, and our best evidence right now is that, uh, that they are. Um, you know, that being said, if there's ever an outbreak of, of that in, in cattle, we also follow up with really intensive surveillance uh, because, you know, an outbreak of, of either of those things aren't good for, for wildlife and they aren't good for livestock. Another question, Charlie, with all the studies that have been done all around the country on the spread of the disease and baiting has been one of the biggest concerns for spreading the disease, why doesn't the department take a more proactive approach to restricting, limiting the use of bait, or limit the time to legally bait or some sort of restriction instead of reacting to the spread and then stop baiting? Sure. Um, you know, that's a, another good question, really a valid concern. Um, you know, I would say that as the wildlife veterinarian, as, as the person who advocates for the long-term health of our deer herd and, and 
equally important for the long-term viability of, of deer hunting in North Dakota. Um, you know, a widespread aggressive approach like that is absolutely my recommendation. Um, you know, that being said, I, the department has to balance, uh, you know, the known risk of disease with, with the wishes of hunters statewide. And so, um, so there is a, you know, a balance that has to come there. Um, I don't, does the administration want to chime in at all about that one or? You know, Charlie, uh, again, well, this is Scott Peterson. You know, we, we, you answered the, the, the question very well. It's a, it's a matter of striking a balance. The question was asked, you know, what are we doing to manage the baiting? And, and, and we've taken the position at this time to prohibit baiting in those areas where chronic wasting disease shows up. We're not ready to take the, the step of banning it statewide. And, and for some of us who have been around a while, uh, if you'll recall that it was addressed in the legislature, and I believe it was about 2009, and, uh, and, and it got a lot of attention, but ultimately the legislation failed. And so I think uh, for the most part, uh, moving forward from here, we're probably going to continue to manage that adjacent to units where we have known chronic wasting disease. Final question, Charlie, is game and fish going to change the rules on leaving carcasses in the field? Yeah, good question, Greg. Um, <clears throat> excuse me, and I, I think really Jeb uh, kind of addressed that, that that, that is a, a consideration that, that we are having really active discussions about right now. So, um, you know, there aren't any, any changes planned for the 2020 hunting season, but um, certainly look for those in, in 2021. Um, you know, we're, we're trying to evaluate what makes the most sense um, in terms of um, you know, what's what's readily, what are regulations that are easy to follow, but but what have the most um, value in terms of, of managing um, the risk of CWD? Okay. All right. Thank you, Charlie. Informative as always. Um, and so that brings us to our last wildlife related presentation. Uh, we're going to have some more discussion, but from a wildlife division standpoint, we've got one more presentation to to hear, and that's going to come to us from Stephanie Tucker. Stephanie is our fur bear biologist and, and also serves as our game management section leader for the wildlife division. And Stephanie is going to give us an update on mountain lions in North Dakota. Steph. Steph, do you yeah, I think yeah, I think you have your mic muted, Steph. Okay, thank you, Scott. Well, <laughs> okay. we'll get this figured out. All right, like I said, I appreciate the opportunity to provide a brief update about uh, mountain lions here in North Dakota. It's been several years since we gave an update on mountain lion management at one of our advisor board meetings. Um, and so I'm just going to briefly go over things like our 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 population monitoring our population trends as well as our harvest trends in the state and then some more interesting information that we've learned recently about dispersal and where some of the dispersing mountain lions that show up in North Dakota are coming from. And so I'll dive right into my presentation now. Uh, just for a background for those folks who maybe aren't mountain lion hunters or haven't spent a lot of time looking at mountain lion hunting regulations, we have two management zones for mountain lions in the state. Zone one is the area of the Badlands region of the state and the Little Missouri River breaks. This is the primary core habitat for mountain lions in the state. This is where most of our suitable habitat is found in the state and we manage zone one using a harvest limit and for long-term sustainability of the population that we have occurring there. And then zone two is the rest of the state, vastly unsuitable um, for mountain lions in the state. There is some small pockets of mountain lion, suitable mountain lion habitat, but really not any pockets large enough to probably sustain a breeding population of mountain lions. Uh, being mountain, like a female, adult female mountain lion requires 25 square mile home range. Adult male is about 50 square mile home range. And so while well, there is suitable habitat, not very large percentage of suitable habitat in one, one con contiguous area. So when mountain lion, most of our mountain lions are in zone one, but they do wander out across the rest of the state. And so here is a map showing 
where all of the confirmed locations of mountain lions have been in North Dakota since 2005 when we opened a hunting season. And you can see again, the vast majority of those confirmations are occurring in the Badlands region in our zone one area. But mountain lions are well known long distance dispersers. And when I say the term dispersing, I really mean this one way movement of a sub-adult mountain lion away from its natal home range. So at about one to three years of age, mountain lions leave the area where they were born. And this is what we believe is nature's way of preventing inbreeding within the population. And so typically they take off, they're capable of wandering long distances and short periods of time. And mountain lions really have turned up in all corners of the state. So while most of them are in the Badlands, uh, we found them uh, wandering through other areas of the state. And you can see from uh, some of these locations, some of these dispersal corridors like the Missouri River, we get more locations of dispersers or more disperser, dispersing mountain lions turning up in areas of the state like that where there is good travel corridors and concealment cover along those travel corridors. So how we monitor mountain lions in North Dakota is primarily done using a population model. And um, mountain lions don't lend themselves to a lot of our traditional survey techniques. We can't do a roadside survey and expect to see a mountain lion. We can't get up in an airplane and do an aerial survey and expect to see a mountain lion. They're nocturnal. They exist on low densities on the landscape. They have large home ranges. And so we really rely on a population model to tell us what the population trends are. And there's three primary inputs into this population model. And the, the number one input of this population model is the ages of the harvested mountain lions. And this is why we require hunters to relinquish the carcass of the mountain lion after they've removed the pelt when they've harvested one. And so we determine the age of a mountain lion by pulling a small premolar tooth right here behind the canine in this picture. Um, and so that tooth is sent off to an aging lab where they count the growth rings on the root of the teeth. So all mammal teeth have growth rings on them, similar to trees. And so it's a very simple method of sectioning that tooth root, staining it so it can be easily counted and then counted to determine the, the year that animal is. Other input into this model is research we conducted from 2011 to 2017 really calibrates this model. So this makes our model more accurate. And so we radio colored mountain lines for those six years, as many mountain lines as we could capture. And that gave us really good information on mountain lion survival, and densities and things like that. And so that's used to calibrate the model and make it more accurate. And then I am going to talk a little bit more detail about some genetic analysis we've been doing recently to also improve our modeling and our population trends. So this is what our population model for mountain lions looks like in North Dakota currently. We do not have the ages back for mountain lions that were harvested this past hunting season. But up in two prior to this year, you can see that we opened a hunting season on mountain lions in 2005. And the population was slowly increasing at that time and it went up and it peaked in about 2011 or 2012. And at that time, we increased our harvest limits for mountain lions in zone one to really kind of drive that population increase down and slow down the population increase. And so that's what happened. We had a decrease in the population following 2011, 12. And really, um, once the population came back down, we backed off on our hunting season harvest limit a little bit, and the population has been fairly stable with minor fluctuations up, to, up and down from year to year since that time. So here is the harvest trend or trend in known mortalities of mountain lions in the state. And it looks a lot like our population model where uh, we had a few mountain lions we knew of uh, that were taken, harvested in 2005 with our first inaugural hunting season. Uh, and that continued, the number of mountain lion mortalities and harvest continued to go up, up until 2011 and 12, at which time um, we had pretty high mortality in 2011 and 12, and we brought that population back down a little bit, and it's been fairly stable since that time. And while most of the known mortalities for mountain lions in the state is due to our hunting season, um, there are a few other causes of mortality we know of in North Dakota. There's protection of property itself, which just simply means you know, livestock producers protecting their livestock or mountain lions being dispatched due to human safety concerns. Uh, there is a small amount of poaching that we're aware of in North Dakota. Occasionally, on rare occasion, they'll get caught in a trap or a snare. Um, and then they also get hit by cars and things like that. Very little natural mortality going on with mountain lions in North Dakota or other places where mountain lions are found. 
Uh, the kinds of natural mortality we have documented in the state include mountain lions killing other mountain lions, as well as drowning. Um, but you can see here the vast majority of no mortalities is our hunting season, and, and that's a good thing. As a managing agency, you know, this is something we have control over. So we can adjust our harvest through our hunters and use our hunters as a tool to try and accomplish the population trends we are looking for. So when we look, just zoom in a little bit closer at just that hunting mortality, that hunting hunter harvest, we'll break it down here in this graph by zone. So again, we have our zone one, which is the darkest portion of this bar graph, and most of our mountain lions are taken in zone one. And we do have a few mountain lions taken in zone two every year. These are the dispersers wandering out into eastern North Dakota, but there's also a few mountain lions taken in some years in, uh, within the Fort Berthold Indian Reservation. And Fort Berthold, uh, three affiliated tribes, manages their population separate from ours, but yet in conjunction, we have very similar regulations, season time frames, things like that. And so we are sharing data and, and it's all the same mountain lion population. Mountain lions, you know, don't recognize those tribal boundaries, but, uh, but they do have a separate hunting season from ours. And as you'll notice from this, you're like, geez, there's a few extra mountain lions that have been taken in zone two the last several years. So we really had a jump up in 2017, 18 hunting season, that there was quite a few more mountain lions taken in zone two than we had been seeing in previous years. And so we were interested in looking into more information about this group of mountain lions. And we really got to wonder, are these mountain lions that are coming from our breeding population and our bad lions, or are they coming from somewhere else, like the South Dakota Black Hills or one of the mountain lion populations in Montana? And so we endeavored to do have some genetic analysis done, and we contracted the Rocky Mountain Research Station from the U.S. Forest Service over in Missoula, Montana. They have the largest database of mountain lion DNA in the country, and so all the states usually are sending uh, DNA samples to this lab. And they can pretty quickly tell us if the mountain lion, that, if a mountain lion that was taken by a hunter in North Dakota came from our population, from our breeding population of mountain lions, or if it came from another population. And so here's just a couple graphs, bar graphs, that show what that data looks like when it comes out of the, the analysis. And so the top graph is kind of zoomed out, picture of over 100 mountain lions, uh, several hundred mountain lions. Each bar on the graph is an individual mountain lion. If the bar is mostly red, that indicates that mountain lion was born in the South Dakota Black Hills population. If the bar in that graph is green, that's an individual that is from the North Dakota population of mountain lions. And so if you look at this bottom graph down here, just kind of zoomed in, showing those individual mountain lions and a little bit more zoomed in, and you can see here that individuals that are primarily green would be a mountain lion from our population. And an individual here, like you see where it's a solid red bar, that's an individual that probably immigrated into our population or immigrated into our state from the South Dakota Black Hills. And then there's also some individuals that are offspring of uh, intermingling between a, a North Dakota mountain lion and a mountain lion from South Dakota. And so this is just kind of what the data looks like. So we have sent all DNA samples from all mountain lions that have been taken by hunters in zone two or removed for human safety concerns in zone two or livestock protection. Um, to this genetics lab to have this population assignment analysis conducted. And to walk you through this map quickly, the pink icons are female mountain lions and the blue ones are males. And not surprisingly, most dispersing mountain lions are males. While females do wander dispersed a long ways from their natal home range, it's not as common as males. So we do see more males turning up in eastern North Dakota than females. If it's a circle on this map, that indicates a mountain lion that was offspring from our breeding population in North Dakota. And as you can see, looking at the map, there's really not that many circles. And so the majority of mountain lions actually uh, turning up in eastern North Dakota, just over 50% of them are actually from the South Dakota population of mountain lions, which are the squares. And so we have quite a few dispersers coming up. This is probably not all that surprising considering South Dakota's mountain lion population is larger than ours. And so it's, it's not unusual to think that they would kick out more dispersers than we would. And then there are a few triangles on the map as well. And these are mountain lions that have dispersed out from one of the Montana populations of mountain lions. And so what we do with this information to make our population model and our monitoring of mountain lions more accurate is any mountain lion that is not from our breeding population 
gets removed from our population model. So all those squares and triangles will get removed from the data set for our population model to make it more accurate because one of the assumptions, the main primary assumptions of the model is that those are all mountain lions that are from our population. And so that's just kind of some new information that we've added since we completed our research back in 2017. And with that, I'm happy to take any questions if anybody has any. I'm sorry, Greg, you were cutting out. I did not catch that. Can you please repeat it? Yes, where in zone two are the mountain lions being taken? Are they more in the western or eastern part of the zone? Right, so if you if you looked at that map where we just showed the icons, those are pretty much the locations of where those mountain lions were taken in zone two. And so those are the proximate locations, you know, more mountain lions being taken by hunters along the Missouri River corridor in zone two than other areas of the state. Um, and the, the other areas where they've turned up just really seems to be pretty random. Okay, thanks, Steph. Great job. Uh, and thank you, Charlie and Jeb, also very much appreciated. Uh, we're going to shift gears a little bit here. Uh, we're going to get into the fisheries end. Uh, we're, we're certainly into fishing season now. And before I turn it over to Greg Power, uh, we've had a number of calls and emails in the last two to three weeks uh, over concern of non-residents coming into North Dakota and fishing and potentially bringing in the coronavirus with them. And uh, I'm not going to answer it any different than, than we have in the past. We are monitoring that very closely, monitoring license sales, where they're coming from. And uh, I've tasked our warden staff to actually go out above and beyond what they would normally do this time of the year and making sure people are social distancing. Uh, I think many people are aware of the governor's executive order that uh, people need to quarantine if they've been out of state. There is an exception to that hunting fishing, biking, hiking, so long as they social distance. And I think that is very important. And that's what I've asked our wardens to report on and gotten some great pictures, gotten some great reports from our wardens across the state. And I have to say that those that are, are involved in fishing uh, are doing a great job of social distancing or physical distancing out there. And I know we've had, well, what about gas stations? What about grocery stores? What about hotels? It doesn't make a difference where you're at. You still need to social distance. And I, we can't emphasize that enough. Uh, we're pretty low uh, on a nationwide basis and even in North Dakota in terms of uh, uh, positive rates right now. And um, I'm right in lockstep with the governor. We need to keep that going. So uh, I know some of you probably don't like that answer very well. But we are monitoring and if we see something going haywire on that, we're going to take uh, pretty immediate action on that. So please practice your social distancing. And with that, I'm going to turn it over to Greg Power. Greg is our fisheries division chief. Uh, he and his crew have done a, just an absolutely tremendous job uh, on this, this pandemic. Uh, like I've said many times, and I know Scott said it, and I think every one of our presenters have said it is, We've had to make an, auto, an awful lot of adaptations uh, going forward. Uh, our guys have concluded Northern Pike spawning, which I know Greg, Greg is going to talk about. Uh, they've had to make some modifications, wear masks, put, uh, put uh, partitions in between them when they're doing it, uh, and they're getting everything done. There are some states around us that aren't even having spawning or fish transport activities because of this pandemic. And uh, our guys are not taking any risks, they're not taking any chances, but they're still doing their job. So, Greg, I will ask you to uh, give us an update on the fisheries issues. Okay, thank you, Terry. Uh, I uh, want to get everybody up to date and kind of the fish part of Game and Fish here. Some good information out there about uh, spring activities all the way through regulations, ANS, and a few other things. Uh, so there's a lot to cover and I'll cover it in pretty short time though. First off, the spring activities, Terry just mentioned it. We are busy doing a, a lot of different things and we're driven by the, the, the fish themselves are on a clock. As I think most people understand that you get into early um, April through early to mid-May. That is one time that uh, the biologists or our staff don't get to set the schedule. The fish do all, all the scheduling for us. So we are out there doing the northern pike spawning. Actually, we're done with that. Uh, 
we thankfully this year, and unlike the last four or five years, we we have in the past have not gone up to Devil's Lake for quite a while for the pike eggs, but uh, we really bailed us out this last uh, week here, and we were able to get in the upper end of Devil's Lake all the pike eggs that hopefully we need for the hatcheries. Uh, the eye up has been really good so far on those fish, so we're done with the pike spawning, and and that's good news. Uh, the need for the pike eggs aren't nearly as critical as walleye, and I'll touch on that in a minute. Another thing that the staff is really involved with is is the perch, the northern pike and channel catfish trap and transport. Uh, the latter two, the pike and catfish trap and transport, more most of that's directed towards what we call the community fisheries. We have well, roughly 50 of those scattered around the state. Not all of them are getting these adult fish, but quite a few are, and they provide this instant fishery, and it's really popular with the locals, especially the youth, but everybody's out there and enjoying them. So, uh, And we're taking those fish from areas, that, well, in particular, the Missouri River system, Oahe and Sakakawea, which is, and a little bit, I believe, from Devil's Lake also, but it has almost surplus pike and catfish, so it's been a kind of a win-win deal. The other thing they're doing, the, the perch trap and transport, they're doing that right now. Uh, we'll probably have a few days, maybe a week left of that. It's critical this year, probably more than most years, because uh, all the water we had last fall, we have this wonderful opportunity to to stock uh, old fisheries that kind of you know came and went, maybe had winter kills, uh, and we also have a number of new fisheries. I think they were trying to get oh maybe one to two hundred pounds of, of perch into each of these waters, uh, 30, 35 lakes statewide that. You know, three, four, or five years down the road, will provide hopefully some excellent perch fishing again, like North Dakotans have become pretty accustomed to. Uh, trout stocking, that's nothing new. We've done that for years and years and decades. Uh, again, these are catchable trout. Uh, a few, well, most of them are all from Garrison Dam Hatchery, and they've been stocked out. I believe we did 17 lakes last week. There's half a dozen this week, and then the first 10 days of May, we'll be hitting about 25 more water bodies around the state. And that's a, a scattering of both these community fisheries where they're catchables right away, but we also stock them in some lakes uh, where they it's really actually put grow and take and they can overwinter. So uh, that's an activity that our, uh, fish haulers are busy doing right now. And then one that's probably very popular with the public is walleye spawning. I think most people know that North Dakota now for, oh my gosh, Decade plus, a couple decades, would probably lead the North America in terms of stock and walleye fingerling. And that has a start, and that's called the walleye eggs. So we're out there. Uh, I don't know if we start our spawn today, but we will be in the next couple of days, the walleye spawning. And thankfully, and or I should say hopefully, we'll get them all from Sakakawea again. That has been a real godsend here for the last five years. It's been relatively easy to get the eggs we need. And, and again, this year we need to stock, or our, at least our requests are for 10 million fingerling, and that's a lot of fish. And what's really noteworthy this year is that none of that, none of those are targeted for the big waters, or that is Sakakwe or Devil's Lake. There are all these uh, mid-sized reservoirs or these newer, newer prairie lakes that people are starting to learn and get accustomed to. Ramps and docks. Again, that's what happens when ice goes out, and ice has gone off uh, quite a bit of the state now. But when the ramp, when the ice does go off, goes off, oftentimes it creates problems where we don't have concrete ramps. We have old uh, PSP or, or or metal ramps, and they buckle. So our crews are out there, you know, fixing some ramps because one thing we really noticed this year: people are anxious to fish. They're they're waiting there with their trucks and trailers and boats to get in. So guys are out fixing the ramps, and we're working with all our partners across the state, which are primarily county uh, water boards, park boards, and sportsmen's groups to get the docks in. Maybe not all of them are in, but they, you know, the, all these partners work really hard to get in, get them in within a few days, maybe a week or so after the ice goes off. And I should talk briefly on this COVID-19 and how it's related, some of the work efforts that we're doing. And fishing docks is one of them we've heard. And it's, I just want to make sure it's people understand we are encouraging everybody to get the docks and we, we recognize the need for the fishing docks. They're part of that infrastructure with boat ramps. It's a safety factor. It's good for the boat, but it's more importantly good for the people. We don't want broken legs and stuff. So the docks are going in. The one thing you probably have heard is that the fishing piers, not all of them, but many of them are not going in. And uh, we've encouraged, our, again, our partners not to put the fishing piers in this year because of, uh, or not short term at least, 
because of the concentrations of fishermen you can get. And it doesn't matter how many signs you put up if the fish are biting, they're really pinch points and they become very congested. So we thought best to try to spread that fishing pressure on the knot, put the piers in uh, maybe for a few weeks, maybe a month, we'll see. The next thing uh, is the fishing regulation update. This is that time of the year, April 1st, the new fishing season started. What's different a little bit this year is this is that two year period begins, that two year period of uh, new rules are in place. And the other thing is a new fishing guide. Uh, if you have been out there, maybe you already have one, but you pick them up at your same old places, the bait, bait shops and sportsman stores and stuff of that nature. But the fishing guide has changed and looks. It's not that since I believe 1991, we've had a booklet or a, uh, yeah, a pocket booklet size uh, fishing guide. Well, this year we went a little larger there's uh, the reason being there's a little more content in it, in it. there's a uh, little color and it also the font size increased, which again is important for people of certain age. <clears throat> Next one is on fishing regulations. Within the fishing regulations we'll have on page four, well every one of the fishing guides you'll find a, uh, of the past, you'll find a recap a summary of the changes. And in North Dakota we've traditionally we continue to do try to keep our regulations uh, straightforward, simple and straightforward. Uh, we don't, we tend not to make a lot of changes year to year to year. And uh, that was the case again this year. And on page four of the fishing regulations, you'll see the new, um, the, the changes that people should be familiar with before they go out. And again, there, there's not a lot of them. However, I do want to point people in the direction of one issue and that's uh, the one issue that we did get some public comment, some public input both for and against here in the last oh, three, four months. And that deals with uh, the fish fillet transport rule. And there was a change with that. Um, <clears throat> they, if, you, if you look at the regulation now, the way it reads is uh, the new regulation is that each piece of meat counts as a fillet. So, and that we did exempt, and this is important because one of the, some of the negative input we received initially was people were concerned about their walleye fish cheeks and also the new one, the pectoral girdles, also known as wings. So we did exempt those two pieces of meat. They're not considered a fillet, but otherwise each piece of meat is considered a fillet. Two fillets are counted as one fish and the packaging of fish must be done in a manner so that the fillets can be readily separated and counted. The reason, uh, this, there's a number of reasons that this, this change occurred and I, would point everybody to the to our website for to to find these changes. Uh, you'll they'll there's a it, within the fishing tab you'll find uh, a, a portion there under the fishing regulations I believe on the uh, facts uh, frequently asked questions and the answers. There's like six or so bullets to it, and we we have there the, the questions and uh, that are commonly asked as well as the answers from the public. Uh, and again that you can find that on our website and that's there's a whole lot of information within our website that you, you you're able to find. Forward my slides here. Okay, one other issue on the um, fish cleaning. When it comes to fish cleaning, I got to impress upon the public this one, uh, this fact that the majority, perhaps the vast majority of the public still clean their fish at home. They, after a day of fishing, they put the fish on ice in a cooler, bring them home, they clean them in the kitchen sink or they maybe out in the garage. This regulation change has not, does not affect. You can do it as you've always done. Uh, go, go ahead and, and uh, clean them the way, however you've done it. The only people it's going to impact are those that are at the fish cleaning station or away from home, I should say, camping, maybe over a couple days, somewhere away from home to clean them, clean the fish. That's the people that need to pay a little more attention to see exactly what's going on with uh, uh, this new regulation so everybody can be legal. Again, here's that reference on the website for the, the information for, for the uh, fish flaying that, where you can get all the questions and answers. Another change this year was to the, uh, or most most 
more recently here, you probably heard just in the last two to three weeks was changes to the paddlefish snagging season. This is first year in many or oh, decades that we, we did cancel the harvest season and it's directly related to COVID-19. Uh, there's just too many issues moving forward. Tradition or historically the, the season begins uh, May 1st and runs for the first couple of two, three weeks of May. Uh, problem is that there's plenty of area. The area runs from roughly the Montana line to down to the Williston area, Highway 85 bridge. Plenty of area to fish, but traditionally people concentrate three, four, five spots. And you have upwards of three to 4,000 snaggers in these, these areas. And there's a tendency for everybody to come. Whenever the opener is, they're there. And there gets a lot yeah. of use that first week or so of the season. Um, so we decided that, that there's just no way that we could keep the physical distancing we needed between the snaggers, not only on the shore, but probably more importantly, campgrounds and parking lots and stuff. There can be lines as long as a block long with people congregating and stuff. There's just too many issues again. And then also our own the caviar processes and our data collection staff. So we decided it'd be best this year to, to uh, cancel the harvest season. However, we do have a, um, uh, we are still on, on paper. We're going to have a snag and release season. So those people that still want to participate can. It's been moved back to the, it begin May 15th. So just in a couple weeks and it would run one week in that same area of Montana line down to basically Highway 85 bridge. Uh, you do not need a paddlefish tag, just a valid fishing license. And so we, <clears throat> it depends what's going to happen here probably in the next week or 10 days. But as of now, that snake and release season is still a goal. But unless conditions worsen, we'll, we'll have something out in terms of a news release here, probably again in the next week or 10 days. Uh, another thing that changed that we had to, uh, that was impacted by COVID-19 was fishing tournaments. We did revoke all the fishing tournament permits for the uh, uh, months of April, May. That totals, that totaled, I believe, a, roughly 18 or so in that neighborhood. We, on, we have about 160 for the annually that we permit. So about 18 of them were in, in, impacted by the us revoking the permits. Five have uh, canceled for good their tournaments this year. Six have rescheduled and we're trying to fit in every <coughs> everybody else who wants to reschedule into the remaining summer months. Also, we did alert all the other tournament sponsors, those from June through October, that there's a possibility that their permit may also be revoked. It's going to be uh, dependent upon conditions, you know, in the days, weeks, and months to come. Uh, four of the, the summer tournaments have canceled theirs on their own. They have their own concerns and they took it upon themselves to just cancel altogether. So just an update on tournaments. Uh, aquatic nuisance species is something that I think everybody by now has heard of and should be very aware of. Hopefully if you fish, you're very, very aware of it or bolt. Are there any changes to 2020? Well, regula regulation wise, no. Uh, same rules, uh, we're looking for full compliance, of course, but there's no new rules out there. The one thing we wanna to bring to everybody's attention that did happen was this last legislative session, there was a new law that was passed and it basically appointed the department to do more in terms of education inspect inspection and monitoring. So we've really, uh, uh, we started a little bit last year and, and in particular this year and moving forward, we will be doing a lot more again with education inspection and monitoring. Uh, it's important to know for, every, I think it's important for everybody to know where that money is coming to support this, uh, this endeavor. And uh, there was a, the funding is from a ANS surcharge that's added to motorized watercraft license in North Dakota. The $15 for the three year period, or it will be prorated $5 a year. So I, I think we're in upwards of over 30,000 watercraft have already been licensed, so they've already paid that, that, that fee. There's also a $2 annual surcharge on resident individual, married couple, and combination, combination fishing license. That's on the residents and on the non-residents, there's a $3 uh, surcharge on the fishing and waterfowl license. And then in addition, the, the new one out there is there's a $15 annual ANS fee for all 
for all the motorized watercraft operated in North Dakota waters, but not licensed in North Dakota. And that's where, that's a new one, like I said. So you'll be seeing if uh, the, this isn't just for non-residents, it could actually be residents that have their boats licensed in another state, but regardless, they will have to have this ANS sticker. You'll see it's this orange sticker, red orange sticker. It's on, well, needs to be placed on the starboard side. Uh, and that's what the, they'll, they pay their fee and this will be mailed to them. But it's also important to recognize that just because somebody, and then we want to bring this to the public's attention, just because you see a bolt, let's say somebody from Wisconsin, doesn't matter what state, so a bolt from Wisconsin on a water body that does not have that sticker does not necessarily mean that they, they haven't already paid for the fee. It, it could take upwards, they got to buy the license or the stickers online, and it can take a few days to get it mailed to them. And if they're en route to go fishing in the North Dakota water, all they need to have is a per, the, the receipt is proof of validation. So the only person that's really going to know is it will be a game warden when they check if they were to check these people. So just uh, be, to be clear on that. And the other issue too, that <clears throat> since this is a new new deal altogether, there's a learning curve that goes with this. And there's a lot of people that we're trying to get the word out. There's posters and you'll see at a lot of boat ramp signs, metal signs up with this information. We're, we're hitting it on a whole lot of different avenues to get the word out to the, in particular the non-residents. And, uh, but there'll be some that won't know. So just, uh, especially there's gonna be some growing pains this first year or two with this new program. Uh, last thing on aquatic nuisance species, and this, this is not new, new news, it's a uh, bad news, um, although, however, uh, last year you probably heard that we did find adult zebra mussels in Lake Ashtabula, that's on the Cheyenne River above Valley City, as well as the lower Cheyenne River itself. So those two water bodies are added to the list uh, with the Red River and Boise Sioux as zebra mussel infested waters in North Dakota. So that, uh, in some terms, in some ways, maybe we're fortunate. We only have four waters with zebra mussels. We have other aquatic nuisance species, uh, big head carp, silver carp, some different plants. But uh, North Dakota is fairly ANS free and we want to keep it that way. So again, everybody needs to do their part to be compliant. Uh, winding down a little bit, fishing and fishery frequently asked questions. Uh, there's a lot of them out there. And I uh, just bring this to the public's attention because if you go on our, again on the website and you get into the fishing tab, I circled five different areas. There's uh, question and answers and maybe perhaps save you an email or a phone call, you can find the answer right there. So I kind of urge everybody to point in the direction of our website. And then I got a couple other things here. Terry touched on, touched on this at the very beginning here. Is uh, can continue. There's one thing you'll probably see a lot of if you're out, uh, it's not just at boat ramps. You'll hopefully see these in anywhere where there's potential congestion of the public, and in particular when they're fishing. But these signs are going up. We got a lot of them up. We intend to get a lot more up here in the next few weeks. Just a reminder to the public to do their part and, and provide some physical distancing. <clears throat> and then lastly, this just came up, but it's a good reminder uh, that these are a couple pictures of, of pickups on two different lakes taken just here in the last week where the public boat ramp became a public parking lot. And uh, that's not the North Dakota way. Uh, and I know people are really itching to fish, but you know, take the, go the extra mile and actually take your truck, put it in the parking lot. Uh, we need to, because it's starting to be that time where we have, in some areas of the state, we will have some public boat ramp etiquette issues. So everybody do their part, be courteous, slow down a little bit, you know, and we can make it good for everybody out there. So with that, I can take any questions you may have. Yeah, there's some questions, Greg, and the first one is a multiple multiple part question on dark heart spirit fishing, and I'll just ask you the first one. On Lake Ashtabula, can you tell us why you closed dark house spear fishing for pike? For pike, yeah, well, Ashtabula is no different than probably, you know, we might have roughly a dozen lakes. I mean, maybe a little more history. Dark house spearfishing, we've expanded the list for pike 
uh, dramatically over the last 20 years or so, where basically the entire state is open to dark owl spearfishing, with the exception of a handful, maybe a dozen lakes, and Nashville is one of those now that have musky in them. Uh, musky, uh, there's a lot of, obviously, there's a lot of uh, uh, problems identifying the difference between a musky and pike. So, again, there's 10, 12 lakes maybe statewide that we do not allow dark owl spearfishing, so people don't, you cannot catch and release when it comes to dark owl spearfishing. So it's it's best to leave leave those fisheries on. And there's a lot of other opportunities in that area. Second part there, would there be any chance since musky usually go to deep water during cold water winter months to have a regulation on the depth of water that can be speared? Could you ask that one again, Greg? I didn't quite catch that one. Would there be any chance of since musky usually go to deep water during cold water winter months to have a regulation on the depth of water that can be speared? Yeah. Also, do you believe that spearing has had an issue with other fish species? Well, I don't know about what the other fish species are. The only thing that's legal to dark call spearfish are pike and rough fish. Uh, regarding musky going deep, man, you start getting, you, you start regulating depth of of waters and stuff of that nature you know, that uh, it'd be one thing if we didn't have other opportunity but we so i'm i'm just ballparking now but we probably have close to 200 other pike lakes out there so it's not like we're limited in opportunity and that's true for almost every location in the state except for the southwest part of north dakota so yeah i don't think we'd want to get into fine-tuning regulations where we're looking at depth Another question, Greg, has Game and Fish considered increasing the number of lakes that are stocked with crappie, or is this a habitat issue? Uh, you know, that's a good good question. Crappie are uh, kind of a <clears throat> frustrating species for biologists, probably even more so than fish anglers out there. Uh, the public would be really surprised how many lakes, how many lakes throughout the state have crappie in them, and good numbers of crappie. But when I say that, I'm talking young crappie. Uh, the issue with, in, uh, for whatever reason, we're not sure, sure yet, but we have phenomenal reproduction in crappie in many, many lakes around the state. We don't need to stock them. Mother Nature does it. Problem is that they don't overwinter very well most years. They don't grow very well in the first year. They're only maybe two inches long at, at best. And we, we kind of hypothesize there's not enough lipids to get them through our, our winters are tough and we just don't see a good survival crappie, young of the year crappie over winter. And the other thing with crappie is they are a very preferred food item for about every fish out there. It, crappie are, are excellent uh, table fare for walleye, pike, everything. So we do also see a lot of consumption by predators on the, on the young crappie. Another question, Greg, with the continued rise of guides and outfitters on Devil's Lake, why hasn't the management of the Devil's Lake system changed with the focus on longer term conservation? I'm not, so, yeah, I'm not so sure guides and outfitters have a lot to do with the, what's driving Devil's Lake fishery. Uh, the, the issue there is Devil's Lake fishery is no, is no different than a couple hundred prairie lakes we have out there and that's the point north dakota's waters are not like most other states we we and evidence would be last last fall with the tremendous rains we had uh, <clears throat> we have droughts and floods droughts and floods water levels instead of fluctuating five inches fluctuate five feet and devil's lake is just a large prairie lake and uh it's driven by the same things what's been lacking in devil's lake in the last four or five years, water has been going down some. Uh, we need a good year class of perch. I know a lot of people want the perch back, and maybe this year will be that year. We have a bit of a rise going on right now up there, but we need that flooded vegetation. We're really going to see that in the Prairie Lakes. Hopefully, we'll see that in Devil's Lake, and then you'll get that productivity back. Uh, that's what drives these fisheries. Our, their productivity is off the charts high, so that's why we have the good fishing we have. But And Devil's Lake is no different. We just need a a little bit more water at, at, at this at critical time, which is right now, and we perhaps will have a good uh, year class of, in particular, particular perch. And the final question for you, Greg, is a two-part question. Will the summer creel survey on the Red River plan for this year be going on as scheduled, 
and any updates on the telemetry and tagging work being done along the river? Uh, yeah, North Dakota Game and Fish Department does it in cooperation and works with uh, Minnesota DNR on both roads, as well as Manitoba is also involved with it. And sometimes we farm some of the work out to university students. <clears throat> Unfortunately, they were not. We're going to suspend it one year, pushing everything back a year because of the uh, just there's just too many issues dealing with multiple jurisdictions in the public and, and the uncertainties right now with COVID-19. So we're going to continue. It's just going to be set back one year. OK, thank you, Greg. Uh, great information and great questions. Uh, we're getting into the question and answer period now, and I know it's getting relatively late and, and we're not going to get to all of the questions. There's been so many and thank you for that. Appreciate it. Uh, I guess I will again before we answer a few more questions here is if we don't get to your question, please either send into the send your, your contact information into the email address uh, that's shown on your screen again now or uh, if you've already emailed in, we already have your email address. We will get back to you. But in the meantime, I know there's a couple questions that came up uh, after Greg Link was done with his presentation. And uh, I'd like Greg to come up here and, and answer a couple of those if he would. Fire away, Greg. Greg, if a student contacts a local instructor, can we do the testing and how do we report that to the department? I'm assuming um, the question is referring to the testing practical part after the online test. And there's a lot of pieces going on here, obviously, in some of those smaller communities, um, students, no instructors, things like that. So they think maybe we take an opportunity to contact our instructor, but realize with those practicals, there's a lot of hands on things going on. There's passing um, uh, those those training aids back and forth. Um, and and so there's a lot of contact there and we have a lot of our instructors are over. Our instructors, we want to take care of our students and even though we probably could have some of those small practicals that were set up, by, you know, um, intimately between the the instructor and the students in those smaller areas, whatever, we'd like to prefer just to hold off. That was kind of what that temporary certification is about. It's to kind of take the edge off. Um, everybody can kind of chill out for a while and when we can get back to it. Um, really, you know, we don't need to be pestering the instructors right now. Let's let's wait till things settle down. Um, the con pandemic concerns are are reduced and then we can get into those practicals and we'll we'll hit it full force and there'll be an opportunity to get fully certified. So. The next question, Greg, is if my 10 year old daughter was enrolled to take the core the class through her school. It was canceled, of course. Can she take the class since she was once registered or will she have to wait until she's 12? OK, I mean, I'm going to talk a little bit about 10 year olds and 11 year olds. Um, the reason we really stuck to the 12 year turning 12 um, for the online um, course is that we've seen um, younger students really need that um, person to person um, uh, live instruction. It just they just learn better when online they just it doesn't um, soak in it, you know it, and so we really don't want to push this on those younger students. They don't really need the Hunter Education certification right now. So again, let's just wait off until they're that age that they can really uh, go through either go through when our traditional courses get back on, on online. You know, send those younger th students through that the traditional course or they can wait, you know, like, again, wait till um, later on to get on the online one. Any other ones? All right. Thanks, Greg. Thank you, Greg. Uh, I know we have a couple questions for Charlie here now, and Greg needs to shrink a couple inches, or I need to grow a couple, one of the two here. Uh, I know we have a couple for Charlie Bonson here, our veterinarian, uh, a couple of very good questions, actually. So, Charlie, I'm going to put you on the screen now. Yeah, Charlie, are there lessons to be learned about how we handle a human disease, such as COVID-19? 
stop the spread of CWD? Oh, yeah, certainly. Um, you know, I'm, again, I'm, I'm reluctant to equate the two um, in issues of, in, you know, in terms of importance, but, but yeah, I mean, a lot of the concepts that are used to try to manage uh, COVID-19 are things that we have in place. Um, you know, social distancing is, is an issue with, uh, um, is kind of the principle, principle behind uh, baiting and why baiting is high risk is, um, you know, it increases those transmissible opportunities, which Governor Burgum uh, uses. Um, you know, another another concept is is this idea of movement. You know, we know that that um, part of what what causes problems with with human disease is when you have people kind of moving all around and, and serving as a new source of infection for a community that would otherwise be free of that. And and that's what um, is the logic behind our our transportation restrictions. So so absolutely. Um, you know, again, I. I I hopefully pointed out or tried to articulate that, that COVID-19 is a viral disease. And so, you know, we're fortunate because of that, you know, there's there's hope for um, for vaccines. There's hope for uh, immune response and immunity within the population to to help that that whole thing play itself out. Um, and, and we don't have that in, in CWD, but but regardless, it it's certainly an apt comparison. Charlie, and lastly, a few questions came in on consumption. Uh, for example, are there any confirmed cases of a person eating an animal with CWD being negatively affected? Yeah, uh, that's a great question. And um, the answer is no. You know, the, the CDC is, um, you know, very clear in, in, in indicating that uh, there's there's never been a confirmed case of somebody being sick from, from eating CWD. Um, it's been estimated that approximately 20,000 positive carcasses are consumed every year. Um, and, and there's even been longitudinal studies where they, they follow people for years afterwards, um, you know, people that they know have consumed positive animals. And, and to date, you know, there's, there's never been, um, you know, any evidence that people become sick. But, but again, there will never be a study that dismisses that risk as, as being completely zero. And so that's why, um, you know, we defer to the CDC's recommendation that um, if you're if you're hunting in an area where CWD is known to occur, then then you do go ahead and have that that animal tested uh, in order to to mitigate the the overall risk. Okay, thank you, Charlie. Uh, we're going to take just a couple more questions here now, uh, both on the electronic posting. Uh, Brian Hosick, I'm going to ask you to uh, respond to those questions. So, Greg. Brian, there's been a lot of questions coming in about uh, who they should contact with if they have con some concerns on the electronic posting. Uh, I would say to probably contact the uh, best deputy director in the in the country um you know, they can they can certainly uh, uh they can certainly give uh certainly give uh, me a shout or uh if this is something that's gonna going to be uh discussed for the next legislative session um they can uh they can get in touch with any of their uh their legislators so I'm going to interject here. Here's the problem with having some people give their presentations from home. We can't drink in a in a public office, so evidently Brian's been drinking a bit here. <laughs> Brian, a follow-up. How is an authorized individual enabled to post on someone's behalf? Well, yeah, that's a good question. Um, so you're going to need some information from the landowner. So that, that's something that they can uh, they can contact the landowner for. Um, or they can get, uh, they'll need a parcel ID. So either way, they're going to have to get this information from the landowner. Um, if it's uh, Johnson Farms LLC or something like that, that's the kind of information that they're going to need if this is in like a partnership life or trust or something like that. Okay, thank you, Brian. Uh, we've had your attention for two and a half hours now and really, really appreciate it. Uh, again, I will say that whether or not we're going to do this in the fall, I guess it depends on, on what the coronavirus is doing to the rest of us. Uh, right now, it's on a better trajectory than it was a week ago, and, and I know the governor is, I, I guess, not overly optimistic, but slightly optimistic on that, so this is a great thing. 
Uh, I guess before I close it down and adjourn, no, I just want to just want to mention once again, please, please, just just practice that 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 physical distancing out there, not just fishing. A again, you somebody's in your favorite fishing spot, go to another one, find the next favorite fishing spot, stay away. And, and I know it's one of those that she is. He's in my spot. Well, find another spot. He was there first. He or she were there first. So. Get out and enjoy. We have an awful lot of uh, activities to do in the outdoors in North Dakota and an awful lot of space to do it in. So please practice that social distancing. And, and like, the, like the governor says, let, let's be North Dakota smart. Uh, we already know we're tough. Let's just be smart. So with that, I'm going to adjourn the meeting. And once again, Ashley, if you'd put that email address up on the screen. Uh, I, I kind of surprised you here, so I apologize for that. But if we haven't gotten your question, and I know we haven't gotten to a number of them, please let us know. Uh, give us some contact information and somebody will get back to you. So thank you again, everybody, and uh, have a good evening and a good rest of the week.